primeira. Good afternoon and welcome to the Alachua County School Board's workshop for November 8th. Um, we just want to welcome everyone here. We're going to get started um, and with our agenda we do have one change on the back um, magnet update uh, will be number uh, four and then Alachua County uh, Public Schools trend report and Power BI will be number three. All right. And so this meeting is being called to order at 1.02 p.m. And so at this time, we have presentations. Look like everybody's in place. Charter school application for Rikert House. Oh, we, I'm sorry. That, that's going to be at the end. That's going to be at the end as well. So retirement. Yes, retirement. Bolt. You hear me? Good afternoon, board members, Superintendent Andrew. I am Dan Venturini. I'm the supervisor of payroll and benefits. We're here to do a review of our retiree benefits. I have Mrs. Bolte here, who's our benefit expert. She's going to review that for, with you guys, okay? Good afternoon, board members, Superintendent Andrew. Um, I believe you have the two attachments that were provided in advance. If you'll refer to those. No, we, we no, you don't that. have it. I'm sorry. Mm -mm. Okay. There we go. Okay, so when an employee is ready, whoops, there we go. When an employee is ready to retire, uh, an employee will make a, a retirement appointment with Ms. Darby in HR, and she will review with the employee their current benefits. Employees can keep whatever benefits they're currently enrolled in into retirement for the remainder of their life, or as long as they wish to keep them. Uh, those benefits consists of medical, dental, vision, and life. Now, there is a limitation, a cap that is, was put on retiree life. It changed a few times in the past few decades. Um, it was one amount, but right now, as of January 1 of 2020, the cap on retiree life is 20000 This document is the Retiree Benefits Continuation Authorization. It outlines what a, uh, an employee currently has as far as their medical plan. It also offers them a brand new Medicare Advantage plan that we just started offering this year if they choose to go the Medicare route rather than the group plan. Um, it also gives them the opportunity to continue their life, which includes the dependent life for their spouse and their children under the age of 25, along with dental and vision. And these are the benefits that are continued through Alachua County. Now, if an employee has a critical illness or group accident, as outlined in the bottom, if they wish to continue those benefits, then they contact the carrier directly for conversion. They can have the premiums deducted for these benefits from their FRS monthly pension check if they desire, or if they are an investment member, or if they just choose to be billed on a monthly basis, we do that out of the benefits office. The second page, if you'll scroll to the second page, the second page, uh, page is the rate sheet for the retiree benefits, and it outlines what the monthly premiums are. Retirees pay the same premiums the board pays for active employees. The only difference is when they're actively employed, when they're actively employed, the board pays them as an active employee. That same cost is what the retiree pays. They don't pay any more. It's the same cost. Um, the dental and the vision rates are also broken down on a monthly basis, and the life rates are included as 
in addition to dependent life rates. Now, the rate sheet at the bottom, the, the, the bottom section where it outlines the age bands, this includes, you'll notice, a total of 140,000 maximum coverage. And that is because there are empl retired employees who were grandfathered in prior to January 1 of 2020 that had the maximum at that time, which was 100,000, and then 40,000, which was the maximum at that time with Cigna. So pri last year, up to January 1 of this year, we had two different life carriers. It was quite confusing to employees and retirees to manage two different life benefits at two different rates. So to streamline their benefits and make things a whole lot easier into retirement and for active employees, we went with one life carrier that, that allowed or allowed people to keep what they currently had up to the 100 and the 140. That's why you see the rate goes from 100,000 to 140, because they could have the 100 plus the 40, which was 140 total. Now, that is for anybody that was grandfathered in. New retirees are capped at that 20,000 mark. And that's about it. <laughs> um, the rate benefit actually, uh, it does change. It's the rate, the age bands are a little bit different from the active employees as when you're actively employed, the age band stops at age 70. There's one further age band at age 80 and there's no benefit reduction, only a rate change. Okay. And this rate plan, uh, we are in a guaranteed rate plan through 2027, which means we won't be um, contractually reviewing life benefits until 2027. All right. Thank you, Ms. Bolte. Um, any questions for my colleagues? Uh, one of the things I was going to ask during orientation, um, since we did receive, you know, some questions about the insurance, um, after you explaining to them, especially those who are just at grandfather or those before retirement, before they retire, that, it's, that it drops, do we, in part of our orientations, encourage them to go out and seek maybe additional life insurance? Do we do that as no. far as our orientation? During the orientation process, the, one of the first questions that we ask mm -hmm. new hires is, are you a returning retiree? Okay. Because if you've already retired once and mm -hmm. then you're returning to work and you have retiree benefits, contractually an employee is not allowed to carry both. You can't carry retiree benefits and active employee benefits. So the retiree benefits go away when you become actively employed and they take precedence. So we do ask that question and if anyone is in that scenario, we'll pull them aside after and continue on with the rest of the benefit orientation. Okay. But as far as um, encouraging someone to seek out something in addition to what we offer, no, that's not part of yeah, I was, I was just saying sometimes just being proactive because since some employees really just act like they didn't understand when it was going to drop, uh, one thing is if this is, this is it, this is what we do, this is what happens. So if you want additional insurance, you just need to, you know, go out and seek it as part of the conversation. It's the only thing we can try to help employees because we don't want anybody to think, well, you worked with us for 30 years and now my, I'm, you're taking my insurance from me. And that's not the situation no, at all. Not at all. Um, going over the, the years that life insurance has been offered to retirees, it has changed quite right. a bit. Mm -hmm. Rates have changed and even the carriers have changed. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. changed as part of the industry and what where the risk lies right. as far as the cost factors. So we offer them as much as we can right. afford to, Absolutely. where we wanna keep it affordable for active employees while you're still in your earning years, as well as give the retirees some sort of a benefit in their later years. Although it's not primarily meant as a financial planning or retirement tool, so to speak. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Any citizens have any input? Okay, thank you all so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, we will have the Lachua County Public Schools Trend Report in Power BI by staff.
can't hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I apologize for my voice right now. I have lost it. So, um, Mr. Spina is going to go ahead and do the presentation for me, but I will be here for questions. Um, this is the trend report that you all received at the last workshop that we provided a hard copy for. And what we've done is put it all into Power BI because there were many questions the last time about being able to drill down into filters for ESC students for our free and reduced lunch and several other sets of students that uh, we were not able to provide the last time. So we wanted to show you what we have progressed to at this point. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and let TJ take over from here, but in your package you should have like a copy of just the forward facing one and then we'll be able to show you how to drill down into each of those areas um, this is a work in progress so as you're looking through it and you see some things that you'd like to see added or change please drop those down uh, we are available we are constantly changing this i will tell you that we wanted to add an additional filter that we did not get to um, but we realized that we wanted to do a comparison by dates or time periods, so that filter will be added as of next week. I believe that each of you have received an email last Friday, maybe, and had the directions, but I included those directions in there again for you all. Um, but we'll be here uh, afterwards, all next week, anytime for anyone who would like to meet with us one-on-one. -on -one. So the first one you're looking at here is uh, the tab at the bottom. Um, it'll have a green line under it to show you what tab you're at. So this one is the average attendance by school group, um, the same one you received last time. So it has the unexcused absences across the top and then the bottom bar is the unexcused and excused together, listed by month. Um, currently you can't filter this one, but we are going to add since as the months go across to August, September, November, it gets uh, longer and longer here. We're going to filter it uh, just by month so you can compare month to month and you're not looking at the whole thing. Uh, moving on to the second tab down at the bottom, you have average attendance by school. Um, this is based on unexcused absences, um, so you can hover over each one of them as you go and it will make the numbers larger for you. Um, looking here though, you can go over to the filters on the side and filter by school. If you're looking at just one school or you want to look at all of them, um, just elementary, um, and it will filter just those schools for you. Um, you can go down to just a select school and then down to race, ESE, ELE, um, free and reduced lunch. So you can drill all the way down. Yes, Ms. Hurd. Um, will this be available for all absences? That the one that you just buy school? Yes. Yeah, I picked Archer Elementary. So this is just for Archer Elementary here. No, for unexcused and excused absences, not just excused absences. I'm asking for yes, all they, absences. Yes, they can do, they can add that. So um, we can go even further by race. Asian, black, Hispanic, all the way down. Um, then ESC, ELL, FRL. At any time that you want to go back, if you filter too much and you want to go back, you can click the uh, reset filters up here and it will reset it all the way back to the beginning for you. Questions on that? I guess this one, this what you're displaying or demoing for us is just um, unexcused absences. I was asking, it, yes. do you have one that has both, all of the absences? 
we'll have to add that one. And um, will we get like a printed copy or, or, or are you all passing this off to us to do this on our own? So you'll get a copy of just the main page, the front facing page here. Um, there's no way, I mean, you have to filter over and print each page. So you'll, this is the front facing one here. You could, you would have a printout of that. So I, I guess what I'm asking is what I, I'm familiar with the ABC report, the attendance behavior and core academics that we were getting prior to this. And I, we were told that you all were duplicating that. So I'm asking, am I going to get, there was like a one page, a one pager, and then it was like a summary section. And of course, then there was some detailed things. So I'm asking, I didn't bring one with me. I didn't pull out that to bring. So I'm just wondering, what are you all proposing to give to the board every month or every quarter, monthly, how will we get, excuse me, we'll be getting this. So it'll be what you have there in front of you, but with a little bit more detailed information to be able to compare. So the one pager is just too much information to put on there. So it sounds like she maybe just have to go in and, and meet with um, Ms. Best and see, but let me get Ms. Abbott. Yeah, you said that information and I actually went in. It was super easy to get in there. And I understand what you're saying. If you want, and if you wanted more detail, you'd have to filter down through there. But it's very easy to get in there and then filter it to whatever information you want. So, um, and an overview. It, you, you, can't you can't hear. She doesn't. We can have also voice. do an overview for you. Yes. Right. Okay. Moving on to the next tab, you have the chronically absent students. Um, same thing, it lists every school here that you can hover over. And then over to the right, you can filter by school, um, school name, race, ESE, ELL, all the way down. It's chronically absent. Can you define that for us so we'll? More than 10% absent. absent. So these would be the total number of students per school that is above or 10% or above. That's how many students they have. And, and so would that be like 10% of 180 days? Or is it is it more on a, some, a quarter? Okay, quarter. gotcha. <clears throat> what was the answer to that? Was it 10% of the, the quarter, like the nine weeks or wherever it's we are now? It's a constant, so this is running live as of now. So whatever the school puts in today, it updates within a few minutes of whatever goes, whatever they put in Skyward. The next tab is uh, suspensions by race. Again, this is the total number of days. And again, on the right side, you can filter by school, school name, race. So does that mean the number is how many suspensions there have been since the start of school? Number of days. Number of days they were suspended. Okay. Uh, next tab is discipline offenses by race. This is the total number of offenses. Um, on the last one, days suspended, do we, can we also get number of suspensions and number of students suspended? Is that possible to get those? I know you don't have them now, but. Yes, we can add that to that one. So 
So back to the next one, uh, discipline offenses by race. This is the number of total offenses. Again, you can filter by school, school name, race. So is a discipline event like when a teacher puts something in Skyward for a referral, or does it mean it's been classified as at a higher level? They received a consequence for these. But it's not necessarily a suspension. The consequence would not necessarily be a suspension. No, it could be any okay. sort of consequence. Next tab is uh, discipline offenses by code. So these would be the actual. Um, yeah, events with the specific number. So the actual code is put into Skyward. The actual code that is coded in Skyward. Okay. Most of these all have a number on top of them, except over here, you'll notice this one. It's because it goes past two, uh, three digits. We're at 1,312, so the bar's not wide enough to put four numbers. But you can hover over each one of these and it blows up. Dr. Rockwell has a question. Yes, ma'am. So I'm wondering if we have a way to see um, the number of students at each school who are having multiple discipline offenses. I don't know what definition I would leave that up to probably Dr. Edwards's team to determine like what definition of frequent um, behaviors, but so we can see kind of like we do for absentees, like we know how many students are chronically absent so that we know how many students are having chronic behavior problems? We can definitely do that one. We currently have it in place for principals and APs now, so they have an additional dashboard that they can use to see um, the tiered students for discipline who has one or less, two to five, and anything over five is also listed and it'll give them the names of the kids so they can be able to go back in and follow up with those students in particular. But we can add that one to this one as well. Uh, the next tab is the 23-24 FAST test results for PM uh, one. So there's no changes in this from the previous. Um, you have ELA on the left and math on the right. And again, you can filter by school, test name, grade, race, etc. This is one we did not have for you guys last time. I think. Uh, a question, sir. The blue line that's in level one there with the number on it, like the far left, 7162, what's that represent? That's the number of students that received a level one. That's three through what? Three or through 10. Three through 10, three through three through 10. 10. okay. Yeah, we can filter this one out if you'd like to see it. <coughs> Do we pick one in school? So we look at sixth grade. Here's sixth grade at 
Mabane Middle School for, for both FAST, ELA, and math. And we can go even further by race. Miss 7162, when we ask about the number of students level one, the schools at the bottom, I mean, some of this is cut off. Is that just for? It's because there are warrants on, on the dashboard. All, this is for these five schools at the bottom, or is that for? No, that's, it rolls down. That's okay. all the schools. Okay. So right now, it's only Mabane because we have Mabane selected. Okay. But if okay. we go back to all of them, it's a rolling count of all the schools. Okay. Can you filter um, by grade level, like elementary and then middle? The yes. Yes. Well, we can add that back. Um, I just wanted I just wanted to say that I really like it a lot. Um, I feel like we're getting a little more information than we got with the one-page report because I just like to go back and play with it and look at different demographics, look at different schools. And so I think it's really, really helpful. And I've already asked you about this before, but what, what I really would like to have, and it could just be a, a piece of paper, it, are the PM3 scores from the elementary schools last year, just so I can go back and, because I know that's not loaded into this, and so if there's some way you could get me some sort of paper copy. Okay. Yes, that's separate. That's separate. Bottom line, you can get your paper copy too, but we'll, we can okay. that's, that's separate. Bottom tab for you all. Uh-huh. Go there. Just those PM threes and we should be able to load in like what the state averages were for that as well. And then as we keep going forward and we do PM two, we'll add PM two so there'll be a comparison. Oh, that'd be awesome. Miss Betts, yeah, come to the mic so that our public can hear. So the information you're saying. So basically what we can do is we're going to add back in an additional tab that you can see at the bottoms where TJ was kind of highlighting some of those areas. We can add one for PM3 and then make it so that you can see also the scores and the state averages on that same page. So that's one we can add. But as we keep on taking progress monitoring two and then the next one in three, we'll keep on adding in some tabs in here so that you can see like a comparison between how did our students do PM1 and then PM2. And then we'll be able to also filter those kids as well so you can be see them by schools and we can see them by each of our different subgroups as well. So um, as soon as we get those, we will get those added in there. We, we it will make a change. This this screen right here that you see is actually going to change probably. We're hoping to get a file from the state with the retrofitted scores for PM1. They're supposed to do those sometime mid-December to late December. As soon as they retrofit those, we will get those added back in here as well so that you can see with the new cut scores, since PM2 will also be with the new cut scores, so the comparison will be better for you all. Thank you. I know you guys have worked really hard to build this, but I think it's going to be a really good tool to use. Thank you. Um, so I have a question about how these scores and the cut scores work. When students take the PM1 test, are they being scored as though it's the end of the year? Well, everyone is being scored exactly the same. So the cut scores are the same for PM1, 2, and 3. But what ends up happening is, is that PM1 is just a progress monitoring. PM2 is progress monitoring. The one that's going to count for our kids will be the PM3 in the very, very end. And that's going to be what like the high schools will use to see, will our kids graduate? Have they met their graduation requirements? But right now, the state is also saying that since they didn't approve the cut scores until October 18th, any of our kids previously who were scored off of the old FAST scale scores, those students, if they met the graduation requirements or they passed whatever they needed to, 
then those will hold true. And it's only after they start taking tests after that October 18th date will those new cut scores go into effect and, and make decisions about graduation. Yeah, so the reason I was asking is I want to be able to compare apples to apples. And since, you know, I am, at, I am at, like what happened last year is as we move from PM1 to PM2 to PM3, more students move from level one to two to three. And so if we compare PM3 scores from last year to PM1 scores from this year, it's going to look like we have a massive failure because we went from end of the year full growth to beginning of the year right. kind of zero ground. If we want to see if our students started off the beginning of this year better than they did last year, we would need to compare PM1 of this year to PM1 of last year. We definitely we could do that, but it'll also be like a different set of students right. also taking it. So that might skew some of the data. But we could even compare third grade PM1 to fourth grade PM1. Yes. That, and then it's the same, approximately the same, the same students. It'll be the same group of students, maybe new standards though, um, right. based upon whatever the state is testing for that year. But we can put all of those in there and just you can filter it the way that you want to filter it and then that way you can get some more of that data yeah um, just i want to just make sure that when i'm filtering i'm making fair comparisons right. because if like i said if i compare third graders pm3 to fourth graders pm1 it's going to look like we failed when we didn't what i what i'd want to compare is third grade pm1 to fourth grade pm1 did our third graders did we get our did we do better last year preparing those kids for the next year than we did the year before yes. Yes, I mean, we could definitely do that. I know that for Ms. Abbott, we'll put um, the PM3s from last year just really on a different page just so that you have that information for what happened last year. You have another question to say? I, I was just going to say, so the large numbers are not unusual. It's probably like that across districts because they're tested yes. on a whole year of learning, which they haven't even been taught yet. Yes, and like our the very last page that you have is actually the PM1 state results from um, this last time, and so there is one area that you know we do have show some some deficiencies in, but for the most part, our students are either above the state's average or right at the state's average. So it, it, this would be a typical PM1 for most districts across the state. Okay. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Thank you all. Great job. Next, we will have uh, our charter school application. We'll take them. Well, we're going to get Mr. Lloyd, and I'll get to Ms. Neal. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. Um, he has to get back to work. Good afternoon. Chair, yes, Chair McGraw and board members, Superintendent Andrew. Um, Mr. Strappy was supposed to be here, but he had an emergency. So I'm, just, I'm going to go ahead and um, make an introduction to Mr. Lloyd. Um, the Riker House Youth Academy has gone through the application review committee process at this time. Having met the needs for requested revisions, Mr. Lloyd is here to answer any questions the board may have. Um, to present um, the approval of the Rikert House Youth Academy. I'll start. I'm certain you have any questions? Um, come back to me, please. Okay. Dr. Rockwell? Um, so I, I read through most of this application, but I might have missed some things. Um, I wanted to see um, how students would be selected. Will they be referred? self-referred would would their public schools refer them because i know you're trying to serve underserved populations how are you going to recruit those students that better yes a little bit of both uh self-serve and referrals um we have to make a clear distinction that the and one of the things that we're doing the the name reich house youth academy that's that formally is changing. Uh, the mission of Palm Breeze Youth Services uh, is different than the mission that currently the Wright House was serving. So our, our desire is for the uh, school to serve the community as opposed to support the other schools. Um, so when you look at the kids and the, the, the expert panel that we'll be uh, bringing in to select one, the educational leader, 
and the staff, they'll be de that design is for them to uh, get with the, the population of students we have and then just grow as we go through the years. So answer your question, both self-serve, self, -serve, self uh, uh, Service and some school referrals. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so, an additional question I didn't see. Um, are you all planning to provide transportation? No, we're not planning. Trans we're not uh, planning on providing transportation. That's something we'll look into later. But right now, that's not the plan. No. Okay. Because my concern is the students who would be in most need of a program like this may not have transportation right we understand that but currently there are no charter schools that are providing any kind of transportation that's not something that we are looking to doing right now uh, initially we're uh, really trying to focus on bringing the population of kids that the data says that needs the services one and to uh, make sure they are receiving and achieving the growth and gains in education so the initially our our design is not providing transportation and then um, my last question for now at least, um, when I was looking at your plan schedule, I noticed that you'll be alternating 60 minutes for science and social studies. So they won't be getting you know, the full period of science and social studies like public school students. And I know you're starting with middle school, but you plan to expand to high school. So how do you plan to meet the requirements for credits for graduation with that model. So the we made the, actually the adjustments should have been made on the updated uh, application. So we made adjustments to show that we are all the kids received the same amount of uh, time frame for uh, the ELA, just like everything else, just like the public schools do. And there's no uh, expansion into high school right now. Right now we're staying with middle school population. Okay, Sam. Hi, I know what you're going through. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, I like the additional reading block you have in there. I think that's awesome, that extra hour and a half of reading instruction, especially for kids that might have, have some gaps. Um, do, you, do you have a location for a facility yet? Yes, we're in the current location off of 1st uh, Avenue and 2nd Avenue, the location uh, where currently the Reich House programming will be. So that's the exact same location. If you go by there now, we've done a, a ton of upgrades, clearing, uh, land clearing, to make sure we are ready to go. Um, currently, we are rolling into what we would consider the after school component to make sure we have a population ready to go when we open up for a charter school and make sure that we have a strong parental support group. So we know that we can't succeed without parental support, and we work through with other uh, charter schools that, are, that have seen success in parental support and make sure their kids are successful. And that's what we're considering doing as well. And then I have budget stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll try. <laughs> um, I don't think you get capital outlay funds until after the second year. That's correct. And so that's, that's in here as part of income. Congratulations on the half million dollar, I'm assuming it's a grant. Yes. That you got, that's amazing. Um, I like that you have in here, you're gonna pay teachers 50,000 a year. Yes, and we're hoping to go above that as well. That's amazing, and teachers age 30K. I mean, I'm liking all of this stuff. Um, but I feel like, and, and you said you were gonna do FRS, and you know that's a huge commitment. And so I don't think you have enough in here for payroll taxes and, and, and benefits. That's just, I mean, I did some numbers, so I think you probably need to work on that. Um, the 70,000 for books and curriculum, I think is really, really high. I, I don't know what kind of books you'd be buying for that, but I think you could probably, I'm just telling you these things because if you can get a more accurate feel for how much money you're going to have left at the end of the year, if you know some of these things, uh, you could, that's going to go down lower each year because you're going to have curriculum you're going to use over. Um, I'm not sure what the instructional management is. Is that purchasing like computers and that, stuff? That is, and uh, we actually, the, the, we actually went through the consultant to complete the application, and these are the needs that we saw that mm -hmm. we are, that some of the board members, their design is to have the kids uh, fast track into career plans, and they, they added the need for the additional items. So we're going after those items, make sure the kids are actually successful in the track that we're pushing for. Yeah, and then the utilities, you only have a dollar for that. Why was that? That's in-kind services. Okay. 
And then um, the other thing I was going to say is you might want to look at your insurance. Mm -hmm. If you can get it for $10,000, let me know where you get it. But it, <laughs> that's going to be more like twenty five dollars or $30,000 if you're meeting all the requirements that the district will have, require you to have. Yes, ma'am. And so um, I think that was all my, my questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Dr. McNeely? No, no. Okay. All right. Mr. Lord. Okay, Ms. Sir. Do you have any questions? I can go ahead. No. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Lloyd, for coming. I was, I haven't had a chance to go through the whole plan, but are you all planning to have live teachers in person or just like monitors? Because when I spoke with Mr. Van Nork, initially he was talking about doing like an online type curriculum type. Thing. It's all live teachers, yes. All live, live teachers, and yeah. Okay. And your in-kind services will be coming from the city? Not all from the city. There's other, there are, there are two components to this. We have some other uh, non-for-profit organizations that are providing services to the board as well. So we're working together to make sure that we're on track to receive everything we need. So it's not the, it's not really associated with the city uh, any longer, as you know that. Um, actually, when we put the application together, uh, I wasn't the board chair. I'm the board chair now. So a lot of things have changed since we put this application together back in March. Um, and because of that reason, that's why the application looks different today than it did look back you know, in, upon submission. Um, so uh, there are a lot more partners on board now than we had before, and those services be coming from those organizations. And your initial enrollment, you're thinking at 30 the first year and just adding a grade or? Yeah, 30 the first year and may cap it at 30 the second year. We want to grow 10 uh, each year. The cap is 150. Uh, we have room to expand. Um, but 30, we look at as manageable, and we can actually track the growth of those kids and young people at that time. And you're thinking that using everything that the district uses, that curriculum and all, will still be effective for you guys. You'll be able to implement it and get better outcomes and results than we get here with the district. That's correct. It's up, but our goal is to have a greater support mentorship and make it like a three to one. Uh, we want more adults and less kids. So three adults to one kid to make sure they have mental. And then we added our mental health component in there as well and those services, as well as we still get to control the after school programming. The goal of the uh, the, the, the component is to make the kids, make the boys that love learning again. Um, and that's the goal. So when you get there, they love learning. They don't want to leave because they're still learning. They come back and it's another day of learning. And that's the, that's the excitement. Thank you. Good luck. So your cap will be 150? 150, that yes. That'd be okay. cap over if we, if we get there, but 150 and right now, but initially it's 30 kids. Okay. All right. Okay. Dr. McNeely. Yes, ma'am. I think you said, I'm, I'm a little bit confused yes, um, because I've been trying to keep up with what's going on with the Racket House and the city. And so oh, is it completely hands off at this point with city government? Yes, that's correct. So the Palm Breeze Youth Services Inc., we're along with the Black and Black Crime Task Force, we're operating what would be a new name for the Rikers House. We're going through the vetting process for the name. So okay. the city of Gainesville doesn't have any involvement. Certainly, we're in the city, they're partners. I mean, they deal with, with the Gainesville Police Department, they deal with some of the youth that we'll deal with. But when it comes down to the charter school and the after school program, this has nothing to do with the city of Gainesville. Okay, do you think that at any point in time, and this is probably asking for the future, um, that you would be with lower grades at all, or are you going to just keep it at the middle level? Well, based on the data we receive, our focus on middle school, that's the pop population that needs it the most. Okay. And, and we have other partners that are working with the, the younger kids, elementary. That's what I thought. It could, be, it could be feeder, but our focus is, is directly at the middle school population. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Mr. Lloyd. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next, Ms. Neal, she's already here. Have our magnet update. Good afternoon. 
we have a lot to talk about this afternoon yes. with our magnet programs. Um, hopefully you all got the presentation and have been able to look at that. Um, if possible, I'd like to go through the presentation and then take questions because some of the things that you may ask may come up as we go. So if that's okay, that would be my request. But if we need to stop at any point, just let me know. So first, I just want to uh, make sure that you meet the rest of our magnet team. So I'm Kim Neal. Um, we also have Shannon Ritter um, with CTE, our director of CTE, and Diana Rollo for our academic programs um, joining and a part of this as well. So thanks to them for all their hard work. And we've had district staff a part of this as well, working through some things. So we want to talk, um, first and foremost, really why do we have magnet programs in our district? And we have the definition on this slide for you that is the Florida Department of Education's definition of magnet schools or magnet programs, with the real highlight being that magnet programs offer specialized curriculum to maybe based on a particular theme or a focus or something like that. We do have magnet programs, and a magnet program offers that specialized curriculum to a cohort of students, a select group of students at a school. And we do also have some magnet schools where everyone in the school gets that focus. So that's the, the difference between magnet schools and magnet programs. Another reason that we have those programs is to really use our academic programs for elementary and middle school to prepare students for our high school academic programs that do have post-secondary academic rigor within them. So working from the elementary level forward to, to get our kids ready for that high level of rigor um, and giving them the opportunity to earn AP, ACE, IB, and college credits at the high school level. So really prepping them for that from a very young starter age to get them there. Another reason for some of our programs is just the cost to duplicate CTE programs. Very expensive infrastructure, specialized equipment, availability of teachers with those specialized um, certifications, and to meet our eligibility and requirements for Perkins 5. For example, we can't have an automotive technology program at every school because you can't have that garage and that specialized teacher at every program, just as one example for that. We do have quite a number of programs within our district, elementary schools, um, we have here, and on this slide, I did indicate the um, grade levels of each of the programs because at the elementary school, they start at different ranges. So some of the programs start in kindergarten, one starts in second grade, others start in third grade. So I did indicate for you on this one the various grade levels um, that, that programs, those programs start in. The next slide is those same programs, so that I want to focus more on this slide. And this is each of our programs, what school they're located in, and the entry grade level for the program. Again, in our elementaries, we do have a variety of entry levels within what grade levels. And then the last column here are the seats. And this is um, what we anticipate to be the seat count for the upcoming application season, with Archer taking in basically two third grade classes for 36 students, Foster's program, the STEM program there, also two third grade classes. The STEAM program at Metcalf, we're looking at hopefully getting a full 18 for a kindergarten class. The um, IB, IB primary years program, looking at potentially three incoming classes. The Rawlings program takes very few. Their zone is very full and their capacity is small. Um, and they are a school-wide program. All of their kids do benefit from that fine arts program. So they typically do not take in a large number of students. To Williger, we're looking at two um, dual language immersion kindergarten classes, and then at Williams, two second grade classes. That does not mean that we would only accept applications in these starter grade levels. We do accept applications for subsequent grades depending on seat availability. So for example, from third to fourth grade, the class size goes up. So we have an additional seats, or we have additional seats from third to fourth grade in all of our programs as the class size increases. So we accept applications in various grade levels um, for different reasons. We also do have turnover that happens, families move. Those kind of things do happen. So we do try to fill those seats for subsequent years. This is just the entry grade levels that I'm showing you on these slides. Here are our middle school programs, just like we listed the others. These all start in sixth grade. 
They do, um, the majority of the programs do accept applications in the subsequent seventh and eighth grade years with the exception of Oakview takes sixth and seventh grade applications typically. Their program does go through eighth grade. One thing that I also want to just bring to light for you is the biomedical Mustangs program at Mabain is only in its second year. So this school year, they only have sixth and seventh graders. Next year, they'll roll to have eighth graders as well. Um, so again, for the starter entry grade level seat count, um, Bishop and Lincoln both accept 132 students with Mabane accepting 44 and Oakview accepting 66. Again, that, that is just that entry grade level we're looking at on that slide. We have two of our high school academic programs with the IB program and the Cambridge program. They um, take in ninth graders only through our application process, but they do take in other students at other grade levels if they've been in those programs in other districts. For example, an 11th grader moves in who has been in an IB program, say in Flagler County, when they come in, we would review that student's record and they would be able to enter the IB program in 11th grade. Although for the district students, we accept those applications for ninth grade. These next slides are all of our CTE magnet programs. Keep in mind that all of our schools have CTE programs that may not be included as magnet programs. So I want to make that a part of the distinction is we have magnet programs and then there's also CTE programs at our schools that are not magnet programs. So the CTE magnet programs include the Academy of Entrepreneurship, Academy of Finance, the Institute of Culinary Arts, the Academy of Future Teachers, Academy of Health Professions, Academy of Agribusiness, Academy of Criminal Justice, the Academy of Agriscience, the Institute of Biotechnology, the Academy of Veterinary Assisting, and then at our um, Professional Academies Magnet at Lofton, we do have the Academy of Automotive Technology, the Academy of Fire and Emergency Medical Services, the Academy of Gaming and Mobile Apps, the Institute of Graphic Art and Design, the Academy of Media Production Technology, which was a brand new program this school year um, that will be continuing, and our Academy of Robotics and Engineering. Same as um, the previous order of slides, these are our entry grade levels. All of our programs at the high school start at ninth grade. So again, we're looking only at entry grade levels. Some of our programs in the high schools do accept applications for subsequent grades. Others fill from within their own school for subsequent grades if they have seat availability. So um, looking at the, the counts here, our anticipated seat counts would be um, 108 for entrepreneurship and finance at Buholtz. So it, uh, each program 108. Culinary typically takes in 25, future teachers typically does 50, health professions has done 75, et cetera. So um, again, this is not the only number of students that we will take applications and acceptances for. This is just the entry grade level. And I know I keep saying that, but I want that very clear because we do take 10th grade applications for some programs, 11th grade for some other programs. Um, and all of that will be posted on our website as we get closer to the application season for what programs will accept um, those subsequent grade levels. Again, the Academy of Media Production, as we go through and look at other slides, I do want to just bring in that that is their first year, this school year, so it's a very small program right now, right now looking to build. The next um, thing that we're gonna look at is really the district race distribution, and our belief is truly that our magnet program should look like our district. And so I want to make sure that we note the district demographics and then we will look at magnet demographics and do a little bit of comparison as we go. So this is our district race distribution as of mid-October, right around that survey window for survey two. Again, we do want our programs to look like the district. There's some very small numbers up there, so I'm gonna give those to you. Um, in our district, American Indians are 0.14%. Our Asian population is 5.05%. Our black African American population is 32.75. Hispanic and Latino population is 14.62. Multiracial is 7.34. Uh, 
Hawaiian or Pacific Islander is 0.11%, and our white population is 40%. We're also going to be looking today by the um, gender distribution in our programs. So I wanted to give you the district demographics as of that mid-October timeline as well. In the orange are, are, is our female population with 48.82% and our males are shown in green at 51.18. Again, this is district wide. We are going to spend some time looking at current enrollment in our magnet programs. Remember that as I'm talking enrollment, we're talking all of the grade levels that encompass that program, not just the entry grade level. So if we're looking at an elementary school that starts in third grade, we're looking at third through fifth grades. If we're looking at a high school that starts in ninth, we're looking at ninth through twelfth. So I just want, make, want to make sure that that is clear. We're looking at the whole um, enrollment in that program, not just entry. As we review this, I do ask, let's keep those other demographics in mind. I'm going to show you a comparison, though, in a couple minutes as well as we go. So this slide shows us our current enrollment in all of our magnet programs by race. Again, it's all grade levels, not just those entry grade levels. As you can see, this is not mirroring our district demographics in, in a number of ways in all of our racial groups. The next slide will give you that comparison. Um, and I do want to point out that on all of these slides where we're really looking at the, the race um, demographics, they are all color coded identically. So the Asian population is always that purple color. Our multiracial is always that yellow color. So as you look across, you're not having to remember what colors are which. It's, it'll give you that same trend. So I tried to be very cautious in making sure those all lined up on all of the slides. So as you see those trends, you, you know, those colors will all stand for the same thing. The next slide, not same colored because it's comparing two different things, um, are really comparing the district to the magnet enrollment. So on this slide, our district race demographics are shown in blue and the magnet enrollment demographics by race are shown in orange. So you can see the comparison here. Um, I know, again, some of those numbers are very small, so I'm going to go over those um, briefly with you. So our American Indian district population is 0.14, and it's 0.08 in our magnets. Our Asian population is 5.05 at the district level and 14.38% in our magnets. Our black and African American population in our district is 32.75% but only 15.5 in our magnets. Our Hispanic population is 14.62 at the district, but only 10.78 in our magnets. Our multiracial is for the district, this is one of our closest ones, is a 7.34 at the district level and 7.36 in our magnets. Our Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders is 0.11 in both. And then our white population is 40 percent in our district and 51.79 percent in our magnets. We're going to look at these by programs. Again, the color coding matches the other color coding that you'd seen on the other slides and it gives that racial breakdown by level, elementary, middle, and high, but by program as well. So on these slides, I know the numbers are very small, um, but again, I want more of the trends is what we're looking at. You know, that trend data, again, that the colors all do align there. Um, what I do want to make note of is on your slides, hopefully you can read those in parentheses after the name on the bottom axis. All of the um, programs do have in parentheses the number of students it represents. So on this slide, the Center for Gifted and Talented Studies at Archer, there are 118 students represented. Okay, so those parentheses under the, the name of the program with that is the number of students that are represented. Note also that Terwilliger on this slide is only showing students in kindergarten and first grades as that program is only in its second year. We will be including second grade in the coming application as that continues to grow. So we, as we look at these, just remember our American Indians are that lighter purple color. Our Asian population is that darker purple color. Um, our black African Americans are blue. Our Hispanics are represented in green, multiracial in yellow. 
Hawaiian Pacific Islander in orange and our white population in red. So again, just that trend data to, is what we really wanna focus on there. You do have the percents on the charts as well, but I think the trends are very telling in some of our concerns. Next, we'll see the same thing for our middle school magnet programs, the same representation, the number of students represented in parentheses after the title of each program. And again, keeping in mind that the biomedical Mustangs only have sixth and seventh grade this year, growing into eighth grade next, next school year. I think the, the graphs are showing you quite a bit of the trends that um, we're a little worried about and we're, we're talking about. On this slide, this one is a little, as we get into the high schools, there's a lot more to show you. Um, again, same colors, same trend data that you're seeing. This slide shows the programs at Eastside and Gainesville High School. One thing that is important to note um, at these schools is that some of our students may be in more than one program with one academic program, and they're also a member of that CTE magnet program. So they are showed in the column that says, um, the third column over the east side multi-magnet and the last column of the Gainesville multi-magnet. So again, those may be students who are in IB, but also culinary, or at Gainesville High School, they may be in Cambridge, but also in either future teachers or health professions. Um, just to make that distinction for you. Yes, ma'am. For the east side one, it has 15 in that. Those 15 students, are they only in that particular graph or are they also in IB and the culinary? They're only in that particular only. graph. They're displayed once. They're counted one time on these graphs. Okay. As we move into some of our other um, programs with our CTE program specifically, this graph um, gives you Buholtz, Hawthorne, Newberry, and Santa Fe high school programs. Um, each school, each program represented individually, not represented by school, but by program. Again, looking at that trend data. Then we have our Lofton programs, those six programs at Lofton. Also looking at um, some of that trend data there. We're next going to look at the district magnet enrollment by gender. Um, if you remember, we did have the, um, I'll show you in a minute, the comparison slides for this. The females on this slide are in orange, the males are in green. With 52.13% um, in the female um, column and 47.87% males. If we compare that to the district versus magnet programs, the district again on this slide is shown in blue, and our magnet programs are shown in orange. Just a little bit of a, almost a role reversal, a switch there um, in the, the numbers. For comparison, just to give you those numbers, so they are, since they are small to see, the district has 48.82% female and our magnet programs have 52.13% female. And the district has 51.18% males and our magnet programs have 47.87% males. We're going to look at the same type of slides um, as we did with our race data by program with gender. So if we look at our elementary on these slides, female is shown in orange, males are shown in green. So these are all of our elementary programs. And then our middle schools. Then this is the east side and Gainesville slide broken down just like the other where it's got the, for example, IB, culinary, and then multi-magnet. It's laid out the same way in the same order. And then there's our Buholtz, Hawthorne, Newberry, and Santa Fe programs by gender. Again, orange is female, green is male. Um, and what ha I don't know what happened to my Lofton slide. I will get you that one. It wasn't there, I was expecting it. I'm so sorry. Um, so I'll get you that Lofton breakdown. I will email that to you if it's not in your packet. Is it in your packet, the Lofton one? No. no, I will get that to you. I'm so sorry, I don't know what happened to that one. In the next slides, we will look at the applications and acceptances. This particular next section is looking very specifically at applications and acceptances for the 22-23, no. 
for the 23-24 school year, we took the, accept the applications in the 22-23 year. So it's looking at the applicants for this current school year and the acceptances for this current school year. And this does look across all of the grade levels where we took applications and where we did acceptances. So it's not only those entry grade levels, it is all applications, all acceptances. So this slide, it's the same color scheme, just on the other um, axis. Um, this slide shows the applicants for the current school year by race. As a reminder, as we look at this, um, and I know I've said it a couple times, but I do want to keep going back to what our district looks like. Um, American Indian population is 0.14 for the district. Our Asian population is 5.05. Black and African American is 32.75. Hispanic and Latino is 14.62. Multiracial at 7.34. Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders at 0.11. And our white population at 40%. So as we look at this, this is the applications that we received. Okay. The next slide will show the accepted applications for the school year. This is, what this means as accepted applications is the student applied, they were offered a seat in a program, and they accepted the seat to be enrolled in that program. So it doesn't necessarily show all offers that were sent. So again, it's the student applied, was offered the seat, and accepted the seat to attend that school in that program. Um, the percentages that you see, for example, indicate um, in the total, so I'm going to go to the last um, graph, the last area of the graph, that purple line for our Asian students represents 68.53% of our Asian students who applied for a magnet program were accepted and committed to the program. Um, it is possible that more, more of any of these categories were offered a seat, but this is who accepted the offer. Okay, so I want to be real clear with that. Um, another way to think of this slide, just to, to put that in perspective, is I may have applied to three different programs. I was offered two of my programs. However, I can only accept one. So I count one time in this for the one program I accepted. Does that make sense? Does that help to clarify a bit? If Shannon had applied and did not accept a seat, she would not be represented on this at the accepted application slide at all because she didn't accept that offer. Okay, so that's how this is broken out. The 100% the line there that is shown, that means that every one of those students that applied at the middle school. I believe it was one student <laughs> who applied and was accepted and accepted a seat. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. I was going to hold this, but but given that answer, could we maybe get copies of these with the raw numbers instead of the percents? You should. I can I can definitely do that. You should have a graph that was a part of the packet. I believe Miss Green gave you um, last night mm -hmm. that has oh in a table form. in a table. Yes, ma'am. So you do have a table <laughs> of the the raw data. Um, but I can definitely, if, if it would be beneficial, recreate the graphs with that number, but the, it is on the table as well. That's fine. Okay. Can you send the file? I can send the file, yes ma'am. All right, so next we're going to look at the same thing, applications versus acceptances by gender. Um, so uh, the elementary, middle, high, and then the totals again are shown here keeping in mind those district demographics at the 48.82% female and the 51.18 male. Applications for the total district, I'll give you those numbers, I won't go through the, the breakdown by, by level. We had 51.19% of our applicants were female and 48.81% of our applicants were male. Accepted, you'll see this is the same breakdown, the same rationale. They had to have applied, been offered the seat, and accepted their seat to be a part of this count um, here. The um, accepted by gender for our females as a total was 61.16% and 58.97 for males for the acceptance <coughs> rates. Okay. 
And yes, I will send those tables to you in the Excel files, so you'll have those as well. I'm going to transition a little now to talk about our policy for magnet programs. Policy 5120.03, the school choice policy, does refer to magnet and our career and technical education or CTE magnet programs. That application process is addressed um, in that the programs will have pre-established criteria for admission and that the application process will begin in January each year for the following school year. It also talks about the application process having no applications accepted after June 30th unless seats remain available in that particular program. In a few moments, we're going to talk about locking in your seats. This, that's a different um, idea than what we're talking about in the application process. I'll clear that up when we get to that piece as well. The policy also discusses the lottery process as a part of the policy indicating that a certain number of seats will be filled using a random lottery for all students who meet the minimum eligibility requirements for the program or programs applied. So if they apply for multiple programs, they would um, need to meet those requirements and would run in the lottery for each of those programs they applied to. It also states that the district will process Alachua County residents before processing out of county residents. The current policy also indicates that students will be ineligible for lottery selection if they have more than 10 unexcused absences or do not meet specific behavior requirements. Acceptance is also covered in the policy and ensures that parents must signify their acceptance of an offered seat by the deadline that's included in the offer. They get those via emails. And they must accept only one program unless that program, those programs are at the same school and allow for dual enrollment, like IV and culinary, or Cambridge with future teachers, or Cambridge with health professions. If the offer is not accepted by the deadline, the offer is revoked and offered to the next student on the wait list. So we're not holding up that offer process for families that are not responding. Revocation of magnet seats is also covered and um, can occur following acceptance if a student does not continue to meet the eligibility requirements or they do not meet the eligibility requirements to remain in the program after they have started. So revocation can happen at, any, at either of those points. And then transportation, which we will discuss shortly, may be provided but is not guaranteed for those magnet programs per the policy. In reviewing the policy and in reviewing the requirements for magnets and our procedures and processes for magnets. We've had a lot of discussion with the district magnet team and district leadership to review our application policies and procedures. Through those discussions, there are some parts of the operational procedures remaining the same and some parts are being updated. Requirements remaining the same are the attendance and discipline requirements as those are laid out in policy the online application system, so we're gonna keep that same system that we've been using, the lottery process, not necessarily all of the lottery rules, but the lottery process is remaining the same, and the GPA for our CTE magnet programs is remaining at that 2.5 minimum. Some of the changes that will be implemented as some of our operational changes for the upcoming magnet season for the 24-25 school year include the removal of the N, U, D, and F grades from the elementary requirements at the um, older process, our, our previous process, excluded children who had N's, U's, D's, or F's in their academic performance. The team and our district leadership feel that we don't want to exclude a six or seven year old because they got a U in science in one quarter. That, that's very exclusionary. We don't want to, to do that to our students. Additionally, we have had schools in their school selection side accept students who had N's, U's, D's, and F's. In this last school year alone, we had 11 elementary school students who were offered seats by the school selection that had these grades. So if we aren't going to use our own rules, we might not need that rule, right? So that's one of the, the thoughts behind that. Our GPA requirements for middle school applicants is changing from a 3.0 to a 2.5 for the same reasons as the removal of the NUDs and F for students. 
They have such a short time to earn that GPA and one grade can very easily pull down a GPA when you're looking at a very short window of time. So we did feel it appropriate to reduce that GPA requirement. In our high school academic programs, the GPA requirement is changing from a 3.5 to a 3.0. Same rules we've talked about, some of the rationale um, exists there as well, but this past school year in our school selection process alone, we had 51 five one students who were selected into academic programs who were below the 3.5 minimum. Some of them in the high twos with a 2.8, 2.9. So those students are being successful in the programs. So we needed to, as a district, we felt it was a, a strong belief to reduce that GPA level down, especially if we have 51 successful students who didn't have that accepted this school year through the school selection process. Keep in mind the lottery selection process is very tight to those standards and doesn't break those rules. Schools can look at and select anyone from that application pool. So that's where it was 51 school selected students who had the lower GPA. The lottery would not have allowed that process because it's that algorithm in the system. Additional changes um, and updates for this school year. In prior years, our middle school students could select three programs, but our elementary and high school students could select up to four programs. They don't have to select three or four. They could only do one if they chose to do one. We're updating this to three programs for all levels of the application. We found that it's very rare for students to accept and attend their fourth choice, and having four choices adds to the complexities of the lottery process with the limited time frame and the needs for parents to commit to programs. Remember, our lottery process runs by rank order. Our students and parents do rank their choices. So they give our first choice, a second choice, a third choice, and in prior years, a fourth choice. And the lottery runs in those rank orders. Often, the, even the waiting list or offers for that fourth choice were very slim because it had run in order and everybody had gotten other um, offers. Another update that we are making is the lottery changing from 25% to 50% of the students being selected via lottery. In 2018, our district equity plan stated that in year one of the lottery, there would be 25% lottery selection, followed by 50% in year two, 75% in year three, and 100% in year four. That was in 2018. If we had followed that plan, we would be at 100% lottery selection already. So that's part of the reason for that change as well as equity and access to our programs. Another update is that in our over capacity schools, those that are over 100% enrolled, the schools in their school selection side may select up to 50% of their school selection as out of zone students. This means for example, the finance program at Buholtz has 108 seats. Buholtz we know is over 100% enrolled. Of those 108 seats, 54 of those seats in the 50-50, 50% school, 50% lottery selection, 54 of those would be school selected seats. And because they are an over capacity school, 27 of those seats could be offered to students out of Buholtz school zone. So 50% of their 50% school selection could be out of zone at the um, schools who are over 100%. This year, that rule applies for Newberry High School and Buholtz High School. Those are our two that are over the 100% capacity. <coughs> Additional updates and another change to note is that out of county students may not be accepted into any program through school selection or through school waiting lists. Out of county students will run through the lottery process only to ensure that our Alachua County residents have priorities and placements. The lottery runs in in-county students prior to out-of-county students in that the lottery rules are built to run that way. And in our high schools, they actually run, the lottery will run in zone students, then out of zone students, then out of county students in the lottery process. Out-of-county students can still get into programs once all of the in-county students have been placed and there are still seats available in programs. 
Another update is our program acceptances will be locked in as of June 1st. This date in prior years was June 30th. What that means by locking in is that students who have already accepted a seat in a program by June 1st will not be able to change programs after June 1st. Seats will continue to be offered from the waiting list if seats are available in programs to the students who are still on waiting list and not already in a program. This June 1st date is to help our schools know who their students are who are coming to them as well as assisting in scheduling, allocations, transportation planning, all kinds of things with that. Again, we will still offer off of wait list if there are seats available. And one more update for this year is that we are um, currently under development of our magnet, our district magnet review committee. This committee will develop policies and systems related to problem solving for students needing support, academic and behavioral pro probation, and potential dismissal from a magnet program. Part of the purpose of this team is to ensure communication with the district and parents regarding student progress, support, and retention in our programs. This will also help us monitor retention in our programs. I know some of you have asked questions even this morning about the retention rate in our programs, and we don't really have that data. Part of the um, purpose of this um, Magnet Review Committee will be to help us gather that data and to set the policies and procedures around that retention data. We are also working very hard this year on improved communication through both the application system but also through district applications as well. Um, it's a high priority for us this season. One issue that has been discovered is that parents are not always replying to the emails and accepting the seat because they either don't see the email or the timeline gets forgotten by that. Um, we've, we've also noted some language barriers with communication as the emails go out. So our goal is to increase communication by ensuring both parents or guardians listed in the application will receive the decision email. In the past, only the primary person in the application has received that email, so one person got that email. So now we are asking if they would like to add that second guardian and add the email address so both of them will get that notification. In addition, um, we will also be sending students an email, not with the decision, but letting them know that their parents have received the decision outcome email. So middle and high school students will receive that to be able to go, hey mom, did you check your email? I wanna know what happened, what happened? So we're hoping that by including students in that communication process, that may also help the outcome of parents logging in and actually accepting the seats and, and doing that. Um, so we do believe that more families will respond to the deadlines and by the deadlines and actually respond um, with that increased communication. We've also created a dedicated magnet phone line that is, that's the only calls that will be coming into this phone line um, as well as we're keeping our dedicated email address. However, we do have a staff member responsible for reviewing those emails and phone messages daily to route those to the appropriate team member that you see sitting here with me to be able to answer that. Um, so if it's a specific question about an academic program, that will be routed to Ms. Rollo. If it's specific to CTE programs, that will be routed to Ms. Ritter. General process questions will be routed to me and we'll be able to get back with our families in hopefully a very timely manner with our goal being within one to two business days, having an email or a phone call responded to. I know that in, in the past has been a concern. Um, so we really are working on that communication piece. That um, phone number will be, it is already on the website um, for Magnets. We need to continue to update that website, but that phone number and the email address is already there, listed there for families. Transportation, and I am going to invite Dr. Rawls up at any point to um, chime in on this, or Ms. Eunice as well. This is straight off of our um, websites where the district will continue to provide busing for students attending magnet programs um, unless they attend a magnet at their zone school and live less than two miles from that school. So if they don't qualify for busing at their zone school and they attend that, they would not qualify for magnet busing either. However, if you'll remember, and I know there's been workshops on this for you as well, beginning January 16th, 
the revised hub stops will take effect for our magnet students who ride a bus. Um, the changes may require students to travel further from home to get to their hub stop, but hopefully will also limit their time on the bus. Um, so I will let them answer those questions when we get to those if we have anything about transportation. As we are also increasing our communication, we also are really working to increase our recruitment efforts. One of the things that we've had a lot of discussion on within our team and within the district leadership is we can't change those demographic outcomes if we don't get students to apply. That's part of our issue is we need students to apply and believe they have the opportunity and the chance to get into a program. So we are working to increase communication regarding our programs, the application process, the open house event. We'll be using Skylert and Peach Jar notifications regularly to get the information out. We're also um, next week, next week, November 16th is uh, the High School Magnet Showcase where all eighth graders have been invited. One update to that showcase this year is the academic programs will be included as well. In the past, it's only been our CTE programs. So the academic high school programs will be there as well at the Magnet Showcase. We're excited about that. We will be giving out flyers with, here's the application timeline, don't forget to apply. Here's the open house calendar, make sure you come. All of those sorts of things. So um, I'll be there pushing that while the others are all there talking about their programs. Um, but we are hoping to, to use that as, as an outreach as well for all of our programs. Um, we will use Zello, which is a career inventory. Um, we'll use that Zello data to invite students personally who have interest in specific careers, potentially to apply for that program that aligns to their Zello inventory. We'll be using the bulk mailing process to capture all students who meet minimum requirements, not just those students who are in the upper tier of the GPA or who are in this specific zone of the district. So we'll be sending our bulk mailings out to everyone who meets those minimum requirements for various programs. And we will continue our shadow days at the high school. We also have, I know um, Jill Geltner is going in and visiting our eighth grade students and talking about all of the various high school options as well. Um, so that's another outreach that didn't make it to the slide that is going on as well with our recruitment. So we're working to increase recruitment. We're talking with schools about recruitment. We will continue to do that, um, engaging Ms. Johnson in lots of outreach and social media and all of those things around our magnet programs. Our proposed timeline is that applications will open on Tuesday, January 16th. That's the start of the second semester. That's a really clean break for everybody. It gives us plenty of time to get the application updated and going. Um, the application will be open for four weeks, so it closes on Tuesday, February 13th. There's a lot of work that happens after the application closes to get notifications out to families about acceptance or wait lists or ineligibility, all of that. So our notification emails, our goal for that is on or before March 25th, with March 25th being our kind of timeline we're holding ourselves to with the goal of before that. The parent guardian responses would be due one week from the notification. That date will be in their notification email. The email the students have will also remind them of that notification or that deadline to re respond. Again, that program placement locking in on June 1st for students who are in, have accepted by that point. And we do have rolling admission throughout the summer from our waiting lists as long as you're not already in a program as of June 1st, we will continue to offer. And now we're ready for all your questions. All right, thank you, Ms. Neal. <laughs> a lot of information, I know. A lot of information today, but it, it's needed and I, I hope our citizens were listening a lot of information and it's good for them to hear about our magnet programs and processes and upcoming changes to my colleagues. Ms. Abbott? Mm -hmm. Start with me. Yes, I'm gonna start with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The policy manual was included, and I have some questions about that. I'm just not totally sure about the lottery process, so I want to be clear on that. Um, and so bear with me. 
And so in the policy manual, it states that there are priority placement decisions. And I'm just wondering, you know, like for military personnel, employees, do we follow those? Like are those that, when you get the applications in, are those children, uh, uh, are, they, are those chosen or is that part of the process? Gotcha. So in the first part of the policy, before it talks about the magnet piece and the school choice programs, mm -hmm. um, to be honest, I'm going to have to get back to you on how we're okay. including that in. Okay. Um, yes, I can answer. It's part of our policy. We do right. need to address that. Um, but I will have to get back with you on the how. Okay. Um, and then this is a personal uh, point. There should never be non-district students in any magnet program. We have wait list. And I think we've talked about that before. And I'd be curious to know how many currently, how many uh, district kids are, are in programs. Um, and so if the choice assignment is revoked, the student must be returned to the zone school. And I know we had some issues with that. We've, and, you know, we found that out. But my question is, what are we doing to ensure that this is followed next year? Yes, ma'am. We've had some discussions around that. Um, Dr. Edwards is not here as, um, you know, the chief with the, the zoning department and our office of student assignment. So that is still a work in pro progress is how we're going to do that. And I believe that's part of what that district magnet review committee will be discussing is how we monitor that. Um, and so then I don't understand the lottery process. So I want you to explain it to me. So kids put in applications and then what happens next? Yes, ma'am. So students do their application online. There was all, there's always a paper option as well if they need to use that paper option for application. Those all go in. We don't do anything with the applications until the window closes to ensure there is no priority given. Nothing is looked at before the application window closes. When that application window closes, we then, as the team, go through and any of our private school students, homeschool students, out of district students, um, we go through and make sure there's a form as a part of the application that they have to give us, signed off by their current school, of their GPAs, their discipline, their attendance, all of that. We enter that into the application system so that everybody's on that level playing field with the data as it as it comes in skyward data loads in for our students charter school students and e-school students so that that's all in there once that is done schools do their review of their applications they get the list of everybody who applied to their program they'll do their 50 percent school selection that comes back into the team as well we go in and we enter in their school selections and their school waiting lists that they send in and they rank once that is all done and everything is marked in that way, then the lottery is run. The lottery is run, there's a lot of rules around it. The lottery is run by order of preference. Students rank their choices. This year it will be first, second, and third choice. So it is run in order of preference and it is run in in-county then out of county students. So all of our in county students will run prior to any out of district um, students running in that lottery system. All right, let me stop you for a yes, second. Yes, ma'am. Um, now I've forgotten my whole thought. What were you saying before that? That, oh, I know, when it goes to the schools, do they select them based on academics or? How do, how do schools make that 50% selection if they have a whole list of kids? Each school looks at that differently. So each administrative team would be looking at their, their roster of applicants to do their 50% selection. And every program looks at that a little bit uniquely. So I think, I don't know that I have a good answer for that. Um, I can tell you, I know there are some programs who just GPE, GPA rank and that's their top choices. Others are looking at the essays and that are a part of the application for the high school and they're reading for the passion of their program. You know, so it depends. Every application is looked at very uniquely by schools. Okay, go ahead. And okay, so after they rank their, their programs, they run in order by rank. So all first choices run by in district, then out of district, then second choices run in district, out of district, et cetera, through the three choices. And the lottery in the program is set for all of our minimums. So to run in the lottery and be deemed eligible and be offered a seat or put on a wait list, you must meet the minimum requirements. So if I have 11 unexcused absences, I'll be deemed ineligible. If I have a two point 
to GPA, whatever it is, I would potentially be deemed ineligible. Schools can still look at all students. So the lottery is set by the algorithm. Schools are looking at who they are selecting. So sometimes we do have students selected under those GPA minimums or with more absences or whatever by the schools. Then once all of that is run, it also looks at if I have a school offer in a program. For example, I applied to three programs. You love this example, I use it all the time. I apply for three programs, I get offered my third choice. I'm still gonna run in the lottery for my second and first choices. If I accept my second, if I'm offered my second choice, I will not run in lottery for third because I was offered my higher preferred seat, but I would still run in first because that's my higher choice. If I'm offered my first seat by a school selection, I don't run in options two or three. So there's all of that ranking comes into play. We try to make sure our students and families understand the importance of the rank okay. because it determines how they run. So let's just say you have a school that has, um, they're, they're doing the lottery, they're 50%, and there are 100 applications in there. When you're doing it, do you run it by race ever? It is not weighted by race at all. Okay. The lottery is not. Our schools, I know I've got some principals who will say, I do try to balance out my program. So you could still not have diversity with a 50% lottery. It is possible, but I think as we increase our applicants and our applicant pool becomes more to look like the district demographics, then our lottery should also start like to look more like our district demographics. Okay, I still have more. Yes, ma'am. Um, and you answered this before because I was the person that wrote and asked you this this morning if we have any data on the lottery students that if, um, but now that I understand it a little better, I, I, I still would like to have that data. I'd like to know through the lottery students, but there's not much difference really between the lottery students and the students that are selected by the school. They still must all, or, meet or the, the lottery students must all meet minimum requirements. Mm -hmm. So okay. they have to meet those minimums in order to be offered a seat via the lottery. Okay. We, I did, there were a couple of you that asked that question this morning actually. And so in thinking through that and how I can try to get some data, because again, we don't have really good retention data. Um, we could go through and I can, and I will look at some reports and see if I can pull anything from the zoning code, if you're in a magnet program, you have a magnet zoning code. So I could potentially look through the, or run some reports out of Skyward to see how many magnet codes were revoked or declined or whatever to try to get some of that retention data, but I, it, I don't know that I can equate it to school selection versus lottery selection, but I could get some potential retention data from our magnets just based on the magnet coding that is done in Skyward. So after I emailed you this morning and have thought through that today, um, that is something that we might be able to at least pull how many have been revoked and how many have been declined. And I loved all the, the data that you presented today and I think it was really helpful to see that and of course it jumps out the number of white students we have in, in magnet programs and um, I'm going to read what I wrote because it helps me get stay not get so quite emotional about things. Um, I think it should not be any surprise there are a higher number of white students um, participating or applying for magnet programs. The struggling elementary schools where you get the foundation that sets you up for success in later grades are in East Gainesville and serve a large number of black and African American students. And how can they hope to participate in these programs when they don't have the foundational skills that they need? I don't think the answer is to water down magnet programs. It's the one thing we have in the district that works really well. So I, I have an issue of lowering their GPA. I think that, that it often, the rigor of the programs goes down a little bit. If you have students that are struggling, it's very difficult to be in a classroom teaching. If you have kids all at one level, you can, you can work on that. But if you have kids that are struggling, a teacher's tendency is to to maybe water down things some. So I, I don't I don't agree with with that. Um, so I don't think the answer is to water down the programs. 
I think the answer is to allow students in East Gainesville to be able to qualify for these magnet programs based on their own merit. And that will happen when they get a quality education, which by law they are entitled to have. So if you want a diverse magnet program, then fix the problem. And I say this all the time. It's not the magnet schools that are the problem. It's the education that's being provided to the minority students in East Gainesville. They're set up to fail. That's one. Let's focus on what the real problem is, is which is that we have seven elementary schools for years that have done a not, not done a very good job educating our students. Everyone should know that if you leave elementary school, everybody in this room should know this, that if you leave elementary school reading a couple of grade levels behind where you should be, that the chances of you being successful in any more schooling is pretty slim. Two of these schools are being taken over by the state and we're the only two schools in the state that are in this situation and it's embarrassing. And to say voice out loud that, well, external providers will come in and that'll be great, you know, things will shape up, it's embarrassing. We should be able to take care of this problem ourselves. We shouldn't want someone to come in and take over these schools. We're having a workshop here to talk about changes to a program that's already working well. In a year, have we ever had a workshop on what we're gonna do for these SI schools? No. And a lot of time and work went into it and I appreciate it. And I, and I you know, I, I learned things today that I did not know and, I, and it, cor it corrected some misconceptions that I had. So I'm not undervaluing this. I think that we all want very diverse programs that are accessible to all, but the way to get it is not by making these changes to magnet programs that are gonna water down the program. It's providing all kids with the opportunity to have an excellent, high quality education. That's the end of it. Thank you. Anyone else? Dr. Rockwell? Um, so I have a slew of questions. Um, so I saw Prairie View IB and I'm excited to see that. Does that mean we're set for that to open in the fall? I'll go ahead and answer that and you can chime in, <laughs> Dr. Atria. So that's what we've been working on is our vision of establishing a, a K-12 international baccalaureate continuum here in our school district. And that would be uh, at Prairie View, Lincoln, and Eastside. So Prairie View, Lincoln Middle School, and Eastside High School. And yes, what we're looking at is an international baccalaureate primary years program of approximately, I think our count was around 420 seats that we could start with as far as the building goes. As was mentioned last night, we've invested uh, into Prairie View 5.5 million as a swing school. Uh, there's some ADA changes and uh, upgrades to code and all of that that need to be done. So the entire school would not be available, but uh, eight quads, so where the administrative wing is, if you're familiar there, uh, it's just like Rawlings and Glen Springs. So the there's a fifth grade kind of quad, it's, it's intermediate. And then I would say a, a kindergarten, first grade, second grade quad, you know, third grade where you have bathrooms there in the classroom. K-2 at least, uh, with that cafeteria building that could house some kindergarten students. So what we figured out is using the portables, and I think there's 12 portables, 12 brick and mortar classrooms, we could get a, a school started there. We're looking at K-4 to start with, because um, the idea is, is to get the primary years program going a couple of years. Uh, with the middle, uh, the middle years program, which is the MYP, you often hear IB talk about the IB MYP, that would start at Lincoln in 2025. So we're trying to build that pathway um, from kindergarten to 12th grade, and we're working on all the different details as we are working uh, with school open right now. And yes, it's a whole school magnet. So as you saw in the definition on, on the first slide, um, it's a magnet school, and as you saw in the definition there, it's, it offers all students enrolled in that particular school uh, special curriculum, which would be IB, 
and it's our hope is to definitely attract substantial numbers of students uh, as it states there of different social economic ethnic and racial backgrounds so the whole idea is to um, open that up better serve our students here in our school district create that k-12 continuum we think we should have one here in alachua county with the university of florida and santa fe college there um, and also use our our existing spaces efficiently so opening that up in the long term could probably have a an impact on lessening some of the pressure in our schools throughout the district that are over capacity which is a hundred percent or overcrowded which is over 90 percent so uh, the idea there is to have a very strong core instruction with the layer of IB over, over it. So it's about that strong instruction. And then with the IB philosophy there layered over it. Um, it definitely is a, a big bite. But as we've heard today, we've talked a lot about change. And change is certainly uncomfortable. But we're working on change and doing things a little bit differently. So that's the idea if i'm not mistaken i just want to confirm i believe the brick and mortar capacity at prairie view is 596 does that sound right 597 i stand corrected you were close it was a close guess <laughs> and <laughs> that might be that one um that one and then i believe that with the with the portables there, we said there's 821, right? Correct. But the total number with the portables would be 821, I believe. Yes, I mean, it does depend on, like you said, 18 or 22. That, that variable is there. So in answer to your question, yes, uh, that's that's our uh, that's what we're working on currently and working out those logistics and there are a lot to that yeah that's that's amazing i i really thought it would be like another year before all those were worked out so i'm really excited that it's going to be next year so i know that the slides only showed the beginning grade level does that mean we're going to be accepting applicants up through fourth grade Yes, ma'am. The application program will have applications accepted for kindergarten through fourth grade. So every grade level would be included in the application. That's so exciting. And Dr. Dr. Really Rockwell, excuse me, and Miss Neal. And so things are always ever changing. We know that. Um, but it looks like we'll be able to have four kindergarten classes. Um, and I didn't bring those numbers with me, but we were thinking at least four kindergarten we had good news that we could increase the number so we're thinking at least four kindergarten four first grade and we work on up towards fourth grade uh, but we wanted to definitely start the idea with the with the kindergarten first graders is where they're located where the old head start classrooms are they're right there at that parent pickup along with that first quad so that makes a lot of sense to have them there and the music space is there, the cafetorium, the art, they've got some wonderful spaces. And it's, it's a gorgeous campus. Mm. It really is. Really beautiful. Yes. So if we go to four, the slide said we would have 54, which is the three classrooms, we would have 72 Correct. for the entry grade and for those subsequent through third grade. And then I, what did you say for fourth grade? We were tweaking those numbers, but. Four, so that would be 88 potential fourth graders if we went with that. Fantastic. And so my next question was about Rawlings. I didn't see any applicants included for that. Is Are they no longer accepting new applicants? They do accept applicants. I will say they get very few, unfortunately. Um, so let me see. Currently, even in our, our accounts for K-5, we only have nine students identified. Right. as magnet students and those are students because that's a whole that's a magnet school not a magnet program so All those are out of zone students the, those are the Correct. students who went through the process to apply okay and take a seat some of them are in zone students who did the application process others are out of zone i want to say it's four in zone and five out of zone if i'm remembering that nine correctly um and then they should have some applicants shown on those slides but it's very they do not get a large applicant pool i just didn't see them on the elementary elementary school magnet programs 
Seats. Oh, there it is. Seats five. Yeah. One, two, three. They're the fourth one over on that elementary slide. Okay. I just somehow missed that. Okay. Seats five. Um, and very similarly, the STEM program or STEAM program, sorry, with Metcalf has 14 identified magnet students. Right. And those are ones who went through the application process. Some are in zone, some are out of zone of those 14. So the students who are included in the programming because they're zoned for that school but didn't apply are not seen in these counts. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering that too because that would, you know, impact our racial and gender balances if we included all of the zone students at a magnet school right. who are still getting the magnet programming. Yes, ma'am. Um, and I know we also have programs that are school-based programs, not magnet programs. Is that what the medical program at Eastside is? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's a CTE program at the school, not a That's magnet cool. program. Makes sense. Um, and I just, I wanted to clarify, we've, I've gotten a lot of emails about the changing GPA requirements. It's only 2.5 for CTE. Our academic programs still need a 3.0. Correct. And the CTE 2.5 has not changed. That is the same as it right. has been for quite a number of years. Okay. And um, I just wanted to, I think that that is a positive move. Um, my mom was a middle school language arts teacher for 35 years. And one of the so she was there when ninth graders were still at the middle school. And she was very happy when they were moved to the high school because one of the things her students would say to her is, I'll work harder when I'm in high school and it counts. <laughs> and so when they were in middle school, when the ninth graders were in the junior high, they didn't realize this counted toward their high school GPA and their high school graduation requirements. And they would slack off and I think I think as we're looking toward accepting students into a high school program, we need to understand what middle schoolers are like. They're on that cusp between childhood and teenagerhood. They're going through massive hormonal, physical brain development changes, and they can really be quite silly. I have a middle schooler myself at home. They can really be quite silly, and they don't always make the best choices because they're still learning, and I think that you know, when we look at our firm requirements for attendance and behavior, to me, those are the bigger predictors of these students' success. Are they gonna come to school? Are they going to behave themselves? And in terms of, I mean, a 3.0 is still a B. They have a B average. Um, and I think we need to realize that, you know, middle schoolers are, are not always as driven as they will be when they hit high school. Um, you know, I, I just, I think about some of the things my own child does and I certainly hope that he won't be judged based on decisions he made when he was 12 and 13. To be honest, you're echoing a lot of our district conversation <laughs> around our middle school applicants for high school in that they are 12, 13, make silly mistakes do you know there's all kinds of things or they you're or echoing they, what we've talked about or they do like my son decided he was going to take mandarin through florida virtual school and that was a really really bad decision <laughs> you know and i wouldn't want that grade to be what kept him out of a magnet program right so um these are the kinds of things that i think about and and i think you know giving kids that age the wiggle room to and I mean, if they fill out the magnet application and do the essay and get the recommendation letters, they're showing a commitment and a desire to be there. I don't think we have students, I mean, I'm not gonna say we never do. There are some students who will fill out a, ma a magnet application because they wanna play on a football team at a particular school. I know it happens, but I think for the most part, especially when we're looking at something as rigorous as the IB program, I don't think we're going to have kids applying to the IB program just for funsies. You know, that's just that's just not something you do. And so I or the Cambridge program, you know, these these are rigorous programs. Kids know they're rigorous programs. Um, I, I, I think that 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 
I personally think that's a good move. And I think that 50-50, um, I'd like to see how this goes. And you know, uh, we do want that kind of retention data. And I don't know if we could talk to um, our magnet program leads at our various programs and ask them, you know, because they would know who they selected and who was lottery because they selected those students. Um, they might be able to give us some of that data, but I mean, I, I would like to continuously evaluate it. If we were wrong, we were wrong, but I personally think it's a step in the right direction to give more students an opportunity, especially if we had school selection committees already going below those requirements. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, thank you all for the info. A good number of my questions were answered, but I still have a few. Could you, um, one of you all briefly tell me what are the um, Perkins 5 legislation equity access issues that you all were, um, requirements we're trying to meet? Yes, ma'am. In 2018, the legislation changed and we went from what was known as Perkins 4 to Perkins 5. Perkins 4 had been in place since 2006, so there were a lot of changes that came through under Perkins 5. And the big, big difference is access and equity to quality CTE programs. And showing every time we do our plan, we have to do a CLNA every two years, but we have to submit our grant every summer and talking about how we are making our programs more accessible. So that was my perspective on the team was talking about how we could make these magnet programs that we have again if you look at those graphs match more closely our district and while i like i agree with miss abbott that we have very successful magnet programs i do know of some concerns where miss neil mentioned we know there's some cases well i'm going to sort by gpa and those are the the kids i'm taking or, um, you know, this person's sister was in here two years ago, so I'm gonna bring that family back, which is great, but limiting possibly to offering other families and students opportunities to get into programs. So um, based on everything that we have to meet to make sure we're still eligible for Perkins funding, which is our main source of funding for CTE programs, we have to be able to show. I actually wrote in the initial Perkins 5 um, plan that we submitted from our district that we would be moving 25, 50, 75, 100. And I've had to kind of backtrack on that and explain each year when I submit the grant why that had not happened. So I'm pleased that we're moving in this direction. I do think, yes, I do worry about the occasional kid I know in automotive, uh, they might take a 2.1 kid and that's what keeps that student in school and graduating because it's got some relevance for them. Um, so it's a balance, right? But I think overall, this is going to give more students and my hope is that as students see other people that look like them getting into programs they'll say well i do have a chance i will bother to apply because that's the big number that that kim showed us is there's not the number of applications that we would like to see does that answer um that question? yeah it, it it was i was just trying to figure out if it was some changes that were because it, it said meet act, um, access and equity requirements for Perkins. So I was just trying to figure out what those changes were we were trying to meet. And we really, um, the CTE, it said the GPA wasn't changing for that, correct? It was staying at 2.5. The GPA right. is changing for the academic magnets. Correct. So but school selection. I guess the selection number making, is. Could um, make a difference, right. Yeah, okay. So that's, um, that's that one. Thank you for that. Um, I have, I have, you, you know, um, advocated for more access. I've got a lot of years of uh, magnet data going back probably, I think, 12, 2012, as well as um, one mil data as well for that. So I'm, I'm, I am for, for increasing the opportunity for people to, for students to have the, have a chance, but I want the students to be successful. So. I, I just, um, that's why I asked for retention data because in 20, the first year the equity plan was put into place, 
we had students that were put not in, I don't know about CTE, but I do know several academic programs, GHS in particular, and they weren't successful. So that is my concern. And that, that, that is part of that new committee that we're talking about establishing in finding ways, like if we know, I can say specifically uh, an example. Mm -hmm. Medical terminology might be a difficult thing in Academy of Health Professions. Our department can use Perkins funding to buy really helpful software that has 3D models and all kinds of things, give a laptop to a student that's struggling, take it home, work on it. There's a lot of things we could do to support students if we were aware that they were struggling and being considered uh, to be removed. Okay, um, I'm, I'm gonna go down that rabbit hole because I know like um, back then that the two, first two years, I know it was very well known that the, a couple students were struggling. So I just want us to, um, the ninth graders, when they, if, they, if they're not reading on grade level, they had challenges. And I could um, share with you some of the emails that I have and because we don't want them failing a class early on biology or, or um, you know, the medical terminology or something along that line, if they're not able to keep up with the rigor and uh, uh, A or B in one school may not be equivalent to an A or B in another school. So a lot of students, um, parents where I'm encountering that they, the students have a, a good GPA, but they may not be reading on grade level. So, and I've I told, encourage parents to really look and to see if their students, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not a big fan of, fan of standardized testing, but that's the metric that we have. And that, that is how we're, we're um, having to say, I told my, my own two children, one of them is a good tester for standardized testing, and the, uh, the other one is not, right? The, the one who's not a good tester, she did, did enough to, you know, to, to show she's proficient, but she didn't score like out the park because she just got all anxious about tests. But that test was an indicator of, and it opened doors and it closed doors. I, we, I don't like it, but that is where we are. And um, we've, I mean, I've just seen just some experience just since I've been on the board, since I've come of um, that. So I am, I want us to be really cautious and I'm disappointed that we don't have data for retention to kind of support us moving this in a different direction for us to say, well, we've had this um, selection where the school has selected some and we have these lottery seats that we've given to students who may not have been selected the other way. Th that we can't, we don't have any data to kind of substantiate when we get emails from the public, like we've gotten parents emailing and saying they don't, they don't want us watering it down, but we could say this has been, been in place since the 20, 1920 school year, and we've selected this number of students as part of, um, you know, in, in, um, offering additional access to students outside of the, the, what we've done in the past. And this is the number that's been successful, and this is the number we had. If we have data, we can do that. That helps me as a board member to be able to respond to a citizen email. That helps me as a parent to, when they email, because we'll get emails that'll say, um, when the lottery goes, I, my student, my child didn't get in and you all kept a seat for somebody who wasn't, who didn't meet the criteria. So for, for me, that's why I emailed you earlier asking, do you have this retention data? And I think for four years we've had, we've had this and we should have something. And, and Dr. Rockwell did offer a really, I thought, think maybe a workable solution. Um, if we don't have, have it in Skyward that's coded where you could do that maybe ask the program director so you could get that and compile it. It's not the best, but it's something. And then um, maybe with this current year, is we put, um, a, some t we, we code them differently so that we can, like in the two years from now or the next year, we can say we changed this and this is where we are. We don't wanna have to do this manually, let it be in Skyward that if someone was selected, you know, through the school committee, and because they met the criteria, and then if they if they um, came through the lottery or whatever, I, I just think we really and we need to to monitor that so that we are we are we want to have access, but we want our students to be successful. Yes, ma'am. And like like I talked about, we will try to pull some reports from Skyward based on those current magnet codings for who has been who declined a seat, who was revoked from a seat, et cetera. I'll be working on that. Thank you. Uh, and so my, my other questions were, were pr primarily answered except for, I wanna go um, this IB primary. I saw this in here and I got, my question is, or my concern is how we're gonna pay for it because when we built school I, 
the board at that time was told by the chief of finance that we could, we did, we could not afford, Dr. McNeely asked, do we have the money to open up another school site? And we were told we didn't. So that's why we closed Old Tooele on 62nd or 60, whatever it is, and we moved them to the new site with the plan to, the goal was to, to um, reopen, um, rezone to be able to do that. So this program here, and we were at that time using, um, we invested the five and a half million dollars in to create that, bring it up to par to use it as a swing school, then we have that one over there. So I, I, I really would like to know um, how we're going to afford this because that's additional pressure on our, on, our, on our general fund budget. We have not reconciled, or have we, our fund balance? Okay, so we, we, we're kind of operating in a space where we don't really know where we are. Um, I have, um, we don't have space in the one mill. We were told in May that the one mill, we should keep 5% um, reserve, and at that time, we did not, at the budget, proposed budget, we didn't have that. So I'm concerned um, with opening up another school site. That's one question, but then my other concern is if we're investing money into creating a new program or whole school magnet, but we still have not. Um, and we also have the expense of paying the external operator that we're, is gonna come in to oversee possibly those two schools, Lake Forest and Idlewild. That's additional funding. But we, we haven't um, come up with anything to deal with those students that are at Lake Forest and how we're gonna bring them up. So that's my concern. Um, um, be, even before I was on the board, I um, was very much into and, and was kind of drilled before I was elected because I said uh, there's a large swath of the community who voted for one mill, but their students are not benefiting. So the data that you have in here, I have that in you. Know, I've told you that last night, um, and it shows it's indicative of it continues to show that there's an underrepresentation in African American students in special programs. And if we if we look at the mill and how it is being used. There is an abundance of funds um, being being used in programs for um, that are for a certain demographic of students that are not getting it, being able to. And so, you know, some may say we we spend a lot of money already, at, which we do, but it's not out of our general fund. We the TIS and the UNICEF come in Title One are from outside sources, but our local money that's here, we're investing that, and we're we're being innovative, and we're offering opportunities to. Um, students who are high performing but we're not investing in putting resources into schools that are low performing which is you know Ms. Hutchison was here last night and spoke and talked about how hard it was to do the work and that it wasn't sustained and so normally when the TISA the UNICEF funding has ended <coughs> that's when the investment the additional investment has ended in those schools and so if we are creating and opening a new school site which is a, an entirely new um, administrative staff, food service, janitorial, it adds to um, transportation. Those are all new expenses. We won't have funding in the general fund to support our low performing schools and invest in them to have lower class sizes to offer significant bonuses because that right now the little bonus that those um, employees that work in those schools get are from the, the, the turnaround money that we get. That's how we pay it. It's not coming out of general fund except for um, we pay out of the non-testing grades. But there are fewer resources. So my concern, um, I thank you ladies for and the team for coming up with something for trying to increase the access to folks. Um, but my concern is opening up a new school site and the impact that it's going to have on our budget and our financial condition. We have um, Santa Fe is going to be adding another 75 students. Their enrollment is increasing. We have um, Palm Breeze Youth, Palm Youth Services Inc. will start with 30 possibly. Um, I don't know what they will be. But right off the rip, we're thinking we're going to have 105 additional um, charter school students that will be leaving the district. We have Constellation who will be adding, and I don't have their plan, so I don't know what their next year enrollment will be. Um, that, um, so though I'm, I'm concerned about um, starting that, and I think right now, if we don't have a budget and we're not looking at that, we don't normally start working on the budget until December, January, I, I'm wondering how um, we're going to be able to afford to pay that and what is the logical explanation for that, um, of going forward with that, because you were opening up the um, enrollment period. So, Mr. Andrew, if you can help me with that, I'd appreciate it. With how we're going to pay for that. And, um, 
So at this time, we're reviewing all of our um, centers that are open, schools that are open, programs where they're offered, locations and things like that. So uh, we certainly are budget conscious, and we're going to look at that. Uh, we see this as an opportunity that uh, we can't not try to accomplish based on money because if we always look at um, – not starting things because we don't have the funds. I do think we have some funds. We're working on some particular things uh, with our finance team, as you know, uh, the research they're doing and checking some things out. So we'll see where that final number falls as far as our general fund. Uh, at the same time, uh, we're definitely, I heard last night, I know we uh, external operators been mentioned. That hasn't been decided. I heard a discussion of possible closures last night or a closure. Um, as we know, there's the possible charter for two schools, that those three options, charter, closure, external operator. But we are looking at the whole of the services we're providing to students across the continuum of student services, ESE, um, all those things and where those are located. So we're looking at our sites, site by site, and looking at how they may be positioned to best serve the students we have in our school district. But um, we do as a team feel that uh, it's the right move to make to look at some of these existing facilities that we have that we've invested a substantial amount of capital into to improve. And so um, we're definitely looking at that. But the budget is right there at the forefront of all of our discussions, what that looks like. Of course, the FTE follows the students, but we do have to look at administration. Um, but if administration is coming off the table at a different site, then uh, and those decisions haven't been made. But that's certainly part of the whole strategic conversation is looking at where all of our administrators are, what they're doing and what that might look like because we have administrators in the school district, whether it's at the district level or at schools and themselves that are part of that general fund budget right now. So it may not be an increase to the budget in those positions. It may be a relocation of said district admin as well that have leadership credentials and things like that to help us lead schools that are currently working in different departments. So I thought the two turnaround plans we did last night that you all submit, you all selected external operator is what I, what I was under, that was the impression that I had, that those plans that had been submitted already to DOE and the external operator choice had been selected and that RFP was out. So this is the first time I'm hearing closure. I asked my colleagues last night in that vote um, about what we would do and are we okay with that. I, this is my first time hearing closure from um, about a school. I thought I heard you mention last night in the board meeting closure. But it vote, it, the, the vote last night for the plan that has already been submitted, it was four to one and it, for external operator. Correct. So I, if you could help me follow what your discussion was on closure last night. I heard closure of a school in a particular discussion of Lake Forest. Last night I said that, but my colleagues, right. the vote that happened last night was... Four one, four. And this was this this right here was in this we got this before the meeting so that's what so the I hadn't heard of anything of a closure to and being able to afford that so I'm just that's shocking that we're now entertaining closure of a school so that's I, I'm glad to, to to know that that's on the table now I'm not, I didn't I'm shocked to hear that not glad I'm shocked to hear that that's on the table right now well I would say as we review every single center, site, program, and school in the school district, we have to look at what we're doing now, and everything is is uh, there in front of us to look at where programs are, their effectiveness, and would they be effective somewhere else, and might that result in, in, a, in a review of specific, like I said, schools, centers, and programs that could result in bringing forward a recommendation to the school board. So one of the things last night when I was asking about the half cent oversight option number three, and you were saying you didn't want to do that because it was premature and we're working on all this other stuff. So I'm a little bit, sh I'm, I'm confused. It was, it was, where's our current program, um, project list, things, how we're using buildings now, how we plan to, what, we, what will we be doing with, um, 
you know, future planning for that. And it was said last night, you didn't, you hadn't looked at that and you weren't sure. So, and we kind of took that, um, Dr. Rockwell took that, uh, asked to modify the motion for that. Um, and so we agreed to just do um, the first two items that I had requested. So I'm just, I'm, I'm confused. I'm a little, I'm not following you. We've heard your concerns and we'll be sure to come back and address those. So I have a question about that because the plans were sent to the state. Can you, I mean, I don't know what the state's requirements are, but can you change that recommendation after the deadline and say, oh, we're not going to do the external operator, we're going to close a school? I can find out. Top two is due January 31st. So this is top one. This is where the district would make their selection as to how we would support those schools moving forward. Um, but I can find out if, um, when we submit top two, does it have to be the same as top one? Because right now we have top one, which is we were going through the process of all of the bids and the things that we would need to do in order to meet the deadline um, for January 31st, should we choose the external operator. But I can find out if top two has to mirror top one. Right, because in, in terms of closing one of those two schools at least, which I can't imagine we would close Idlewild, which we've just revitalized, but those two schools we've sent to the state are intentions that the board voted on. So I don't know that, we'll find out, but I don't know that that can be re revisited. Um, my, my other concern with this is we're going through a district-wide rezoning, and if we close a school, I know we're talking about Prairie View being a magnet school. Some of our magnet schools are, have a zoned population as well. If we were to close a school, I imagine we would need to look at Prairie View having a zoned population and changing that when we're doing rezoning now um, seems, it seems like if closing a school was the plan, that should have been the plan moving into rezoning, not coming out of it. Um, because making those changes now seems a little late in the rezoning game. Um, and then my final thing, which is why I was shocked to see Prairie View on the table for this fall, is I thought that there was a process for the the program being approved, like to have an accredited IB program, it has to be approved, correct? Correct, and our team's been working with IB on that, and we've had, uh, I know Dr. Edwards and Mrs. Roll went up to Jacksonville, visited a IB whole school up there. Um, so we've been working with IB on that too, on so the process of, of moving forward with all the steps that IB would require. So where are we in that process? Are we, you know, 75% done, 90% done? Because if we're going to open up applications for this in two months, we need to like have that approval, know how we're paying for the school, know whether we're closing a school and giving that school its own zone so we know how many ap applicant-based seats there would be. Like these are questions we need to know the answer to before we open a school. Right. I think, let me, let me just chime in. I think with what we're doing as the operational piece, they have to look at all of it. And I think where we are now, in order to know which way we're going, they got to talk about all of this. And I think that's where we are. I don't want us to jump out and make assumptions that we're going to close. And last night we voted four to one about external operator. And that's the direction we're going in. I think what they're looking at is a team as a whole. They have to where we are with the data because these schools have been in this situation so long, you have the three options, closure, charter school, or you have external operator. Right now, the team is gonna do everything that they can to try to make sure we can keep these two schools open. But when we talk, we have to look at these things. You, of course they're looking at finances, but I think uh, moving forward, when you have your meetings with Mr. Andrew, these are things you can talk about and look at. But right now, they have to have these discussions. That doesn't mean 
that we're going to be right away and we're going to close the school. I just think that all of the options, because when you're working with BSI, you got to look at everything uh, just to be prepared. And I think that's important. I mean, worst case scenario, anytime you're planning a program or anything new, you got to look at worst case scenario first. And so I think that's just where we are. I don't want us to jump out and make assumptions and take that from this workshop uh, that we're trying to do. And we know, as you said, the, the internal audit, looking at everything so we can see where we need to look at where we need to cut and look at how we're going to fund. But the FTE, my understanding, anytime you open up a new school, the FTE follows the kid, the, the student, or what have you. But I just think these are things that the team are working on because they're things that we are trying to do different. And so we have to look at it financially, but we can't stop moving forward. Finances are important, and you have, you have talked about that quite a bit, and, and we all agree with you with that. However, we also have to prepare looking at every option that's on the table. Also, I think we're looking at Prairie View and looking at, because, you know, and I'm not going to open up that can, but that, that word zoning, <laughs> we know the emails that we've been getting uh, and that we may have to pivot. And so I think that's important for us to look at everything to ensure we, we, we pivot. Okay? And Ms. Andrew, you want to I, I just, I... I'm asking questions because we're talking about opening magnet applications in two months for 400 students, and we don't have the answers, the very basic answers of how are we funding this school? Do we even have approval from International well, Baccalaureate to start it? I'm not, right, but we're saying in two months we're gonna open applications for it. That, that sounds pretty final. Um, we're, you know, which is why I thought this was probably going to be another year out because it sounds like we're still in more preliminary kinds of discussions saying we're going to open applications for 400 students in two months sounds pretty final. And so like at that stage, to me, we should have approval from International Baccalaureate and we should have a plan to fund the school and we should know whether that necessitates closing a different site, which I'm not necessarily opposed to, depending on what the reasoning presented is. It just feels like these should have been things that were already ironed out before we got to the point of, there's a new magnet program, we're gonna have 400 seats, applications are gonna open in January. That's, that's what I'm saying. Mr. Andrew, did you want to respond? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. To be clear for the public that's watching this, we are not closing Lake Forest Elementary School uh, or any school at this very moment in time. To be clear, we are looking at all of our schools, all of our facilities, all of our usage uh, comprehensively. We don't have to wait on the strategic plan to do that. Uh, we do things strategically without a plan. Uh, we do need a strategic plan, but we're looking at everything across the board. But we have a lot of strategic thinkers in this room, across this district, in our schools, in our classrooms. And so I want to make sure that that wasn't the statement, so it's not misconstrued. I did not say we are closing Lake Forest Elementary. Um, what I do want to say is if they have a C in December, if that's when the school grades come out, Everything's off the table. They're out of, of that SI role. And then what we have to figure out is how do we keep those resources going to that school to continue to support our kids as the money withdraws from there, as our board knows. Um, and what I would say is we're not zoning kids to Prairie View when that happens. That's going to be a, a magnet school as defined by the state, which would be everybody across the school dis district could apply for that. I would say, yes, it's very aggressive um, because we're trying to move with urgency. It's always one or the other. Either we're slow walking it or we're moving too fast. And in this case, we're going to move with urgency. And if I fail, then I fail uh, moving with urgency. But I don't think it's something to wait on. It's like so many other things uh, Miss Abbott has pointed out. 
you know, I, I know I can hear what others would say. Ms. Abbott would say, now we're talking about opening this school. What about the urgency to work on the seven SI schools for sure, right? And she's correct. And everybody has valid points there. But what I do want people to understand is it is aggressive. It, it's always all in the details. And it, there are a mountain of details. Funding is a concern. But opening up doors of opportunity and access for our kids who don't have access to the higher um, – the the higher ed college credit opportunities in our academic magnets i've worked at i you know at an ib school for five years and and i'm well familiar with who's in there who's not who uh, makes it through who doesn't as our other administrators in this room you know mr shellnut shared that same experience so i am passionate about let's open up the door of opportunity for all of the children let's have a school set up that looks socioeconomically like Alachua County that starts students off in a very rigorous program. And so we can then have kids off of Lake Road at the University of Florida. I think you'd be hard pressed to go over there and find kids um, from East Gainesville and UF. And I, and we do that, they'll then be going out of state to technical, I mean, like MIT to Harvard, to USC, to Stanford, they'll have that opportunity because they will have gone through an IB program. And when they graduate, with or without a diploma, and Ms. Rollo knows that too, acceptances are made before they ever get recognition or notification from IB in July that they actually got the IB diploma. They're already off and running into college. Um, parents never liked us to share that with kids, that if you're a completer, you're in the whole different stack and a whole different pile. And I just see that as an opportunity for first-generation students in a family to to take the family to the next level and you can change a family in one generation. I've seen it done in my Hispanic family, in my family and in my African American family and my family, I've seen it in one generation. Things change with parents that are dyslexic with parents that don't speak English. And the next generation is graduating from the university of Georgia teaching school in Georgia. I've seen it. I know it can happen. I have firsthand experience with it. So the passion there is the urgency of let's try to figure it out. If we don't, then it's 25, but I think we'd be remiss if we don't try to do that right now. And uh, it's the same urgency that we're going after our SI schools. We have to, make a change there. It's not an option. It, it's a, it's a requirement um, that that's just part of, of where my beliefs are. So with that being said, um, going back to that, that's the plan. It's not to close any, any particular school right now, but it's to review everything and decide how do we move resources around, shift resources around. That could be financial, that could be human capital, and how do we help meet more students' needs and set them up for success here in Alachua County. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, for that. Mr. Burkett, I, I actually, I think that it's almost irresponsible to not have a plan to finance a school and how, know how we're going to pay for it. So our, do you all have numbers to be able to tell us that? Right now, we told our education association there are certain things we couldn't do because we didn't have the money. That's, we've been saying that. And then, but here we are planning to go forward with opening up another school site. And when, I, when we opened up I, we were told, the board at that time was told we did not have the funds to open up a new school site. We, did not, we could not afford it. It was also said to us we, had, we have um, 10,000 fewer students than Marion County, but we operate more schools. We have more schools open than what they have there proportionately. Um, in Marion County. So they have about 10,000 more, more, more students than we do. And I think we, at the time, we had like 41 sites, and I think they had in the low 40s sites for Marion County. So we were told we didn't have the money. So that's why I'm sitting here like j to just say, oh, we'll just go ahead and do it, and there's urgency, and we got we, yeah, money is an issue, but we're not, we haven't calculated the cost of that, I think is irresponsible. We, we have a board policy that says our fund, where our fund balance should be, and then we have state law. And if we get in a certain area, this, the, the district could be taken over by the Department of Education, and they will do it because they've done it before. Okay. So I just, I, my question is, is could we get the board, get what this will cost us to do? And if we're going to open up, I'm with Dr. Rockwell, it sounds like we are well down the road. If we're going to open up 
the application include that in the magnet application in June, just, I mean January. So we're going to tell tell parents, oh, this may not happen, and we we you know it may not go, or are we, we, it's like we're committed to it then. Uh, and 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 in the mill, I, I don't think there's 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 room for that. There there's certain every every expenditure of the school can't come out of one mill. It can't. So I, I just, um, I, I think that, I don't think that is the, the path that we're on um, to go that far, go, go to the to place where we're going, that, that, um, the direction we're going, I don't think that's the right way. So for me, my request is to, for you to bring the board the cost of operating this and how, how we're gonna implement that and how it's gonna fit down into our existing budget. I just think we have too many unknowns now. We haven't reconciled fund balance. We have not come to an agreement with our education association we don't know the impact of, you know, we, don't, we haven't even started, started a budget process for the next, well, I shouldn't say that, the, the board, had, I don't know if you, what you guys have done um, for 24, 25, but just projecting out, I'm trying to figure out how now, when we have more pressures on our budget than we did, now than we did when we opened up school, I, that we can just say we're going down that road. So, so we could come back and offer, you know, Bobby Briggs, discuss this option with budget or cost in the next, when the next workshop? December 6th. Yeah, maybe we can put it at December 6th and have those questions answered. Thank you. You have one call, Mr. Nathan. We can call her. You have three Mr. minutes Mr. with yeah. the board. Maybe we can put it at okay. December 6th. Call her station name. You have three minutes with the board. Thank you. You have one call, Mr. Hello? I can't hear you. Hello? Yes, ma'am. You have three minutes with the board. Oh, thank you. Good afternoon, um, Chair McGraw, board members, and Superintendent Andrew. I'm Mary Benedict, a parent of a current... Uh -oh. Hello? You're still with us. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. You're still with us. Excuse me, sorry, you're really faint. Yes, ma'am, you're live with the board. Go ahead with your comment. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chair McGraw, board members, and Superintendent Andrew. I'm Mary Benedict, a parent of current ACPS student and an Eastside Ivy grad. I applaud your goal of having our magnet student demographics look like those of our district. But I was shocked to learn that you're proposing that 50% of magnet students be admitted by lottery and that minimum high school GPA requirements are at the same time being reduced from 3.5 to 3.0. At high school magnets, academic magnets like IB and Cambridge, this will be an incredible disservice to students who were not properly prepared for that level of academic rigor. Um, sadly, it will also undermine the IB and Cambridge programs, their teachers and students, as the rigor that defines their academics is reduced. In fact, in speaking to current IB teachers and students, which I encourage you all to do, this is already being seen with the recent change to 25% lottery admittance. As you further dilute the rigor of IB in Cambridge, you will see a number of qualified, the number of qualified applicants go down. And indeed, with your recent change to 25% lottery admittance, some students who might have chosen the ID in Cambridge are already opting for view holds, which is, as you know, incredibly overcrowded. So I ask you to please reconsider the 50% lottery admittance until you've properly evaluated the effects of the previous change to 25% lottery admittance. If you truly want to grow and diversify our high school academic magnets, consider focusing your efforts on better preparing our younger students. For example, at the proposed whole school IB elementary. So they enter our high school magnets with the tools they need to succeed. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right, we no citizens are present and no other business. At no, we haven't even finished. McNeely. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have not spoken? Because I'm not even. <laughs> Dr. McNeely. And you know what, um, Madam Chair? <laughs> my questions are probably not even relevant at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to thank all the team for such a comprehensive presentation. Thank you so very much for that. Um, during the rezoning 
meetings that we've had, so many students, parents as well, got up to talk about um, programs and what should happen if um, the rezoning plan is intact come, I guess it's December the 5th, when we make our vote. Mm -hmm. But um, are we replicating, or I didn't hear anything like that in your presentation. What types of replications are you even considering if you are? Um, that's one question that I had. And the other, I think it had already been um, spoken about, and that's what you're going to do, how you're going to do more of the recruitment piece, and, and what, can you give us some kind of examples of, other than the social media or website, what other plans do you have? Those were my two questions for you. So mm -hmm. I think as we talk replication, we do have some of our programs that are a magnet in one school. There is still a program at another. For example, the culinary the, um, at Eastside, there are culinary programs at other high schools. Health professions, there are health programs at other schools. So we're not necessarily re-replicating the magnet programs in schools, but some of those CTE programs, which I'm sure um, Ms. Ritter can expand on, do exist in other schools. And I do thank you for that, but let me just put it plainly. Yes, ma'am. The entrepreneurship, that was one of the largest <laughs> um, requests that we continue to hear about. What's happening there? So we are offering an entrepreneurship program at Hawthorne. Okay. It's not a magnet. And at this point, it's been going, I think, two years. So kind of new and getting it started. Um, we have not gone to the level of adding a school store and that kind of stuff. But that's certainly part of what that curriculum would include and using DECA as part of the competition. Um, the finance program has come up before as far as uh, a particular credit union approached us of starting something at Eastside High School at the time with some discussion at the district level because of our partnership with Florida Credit Union. We did not pursue that option. That may be something in the future that we look at. Um, we do worry, frankly, those particular two programs are very successful at a large high school. Um, trying to duplicate either of those programs at a smaller school would be difficult to have the same experience for students. For example, having a branch of the credit union at a school where there, aren't, there just aren't enough staff and students to really give students that experience of having customers and clients come in. So those are some of the reasons that that hasn't happened. Um, I will say, we did mention for some of them, they're just too expensive or it's too difficult to find teachers that have the right credentials because many times in current tech ed, you're asking people to leave industry, come in and take a teacher salary, et cetera. So that was originally before me, as I have learned in the history, part of the reason that certain programs became magnets because we just couldn't duplicate them at every school, either because of a lot of reasons, the infrastructure, the equipment, finding the right qualified teacher, and then some programs just fit better in a certain kind of school than others. Agriculture makes more sense out in the rural schools because they have the land mm -hmm. to really accommodate having that kind of program. Um, what was the other part? The marketing part I did want to talk a little bit about. We have started already doing something new this year. We have Dr. Geltner in our department you may remember for about a year and a half, we had her as a career dual enrollment specialist through a special grant, but we have her now as a career counselor for the whole district. And so she is doing a lot of outreach. We have had, for example, even just at Lofton, we've had a charter bus come from Oakview and 
Westwood to visit, eighth graders coming and visiting the Lofton programs. We have with the Education Foundation had some special field trips to see the medical programs both at Eastside and at Lofton um, and worked with them trying to just let students know and come and see for themselves some of these programs. You see the video, you hear about it, it's just not quite the same. So there's been a lot more of that activity this year. Um, Ms. Neal mentioned Zello, which we're getting up and running. Um, I hope we can use that data this year in time to specifically invite students. If not, that will definitely be in place in future years to have that happen. Um, the other thing is Ms. Geltner has, instead of just having school counselors go in and talk to all their eighth graders and talk about all the high school options, she has targeted both Bishop and Lincoln and has gone in herself and especially talk to them about all the magnet opportunities. And I don't just mean CTE. She is going in talking about all high school options. And so we have not had somebody specifically come in from our office or the district in probably eight years um, to do that. So that's been, I think, a good, we, I've already seen questions come in from people. My, my child came home, this was this morning in our magnet email, and said they have to apply by December 14th and I can't find the applications. So I know that was from, you know, Dr. Geltner doing that yesterday. I'm so, so those are some of the new things we're doing. I'm so glad she's back. I, I, I didn't realize that and she and I had worked together at Bishop with the accelerated program, but I didn't know she had returned to the district. That's my bad. I'm glad she's here. Thank you. And just one question for Ms. Abbott. What's the date of the showcase again? November 16th, next Thursday evening, 6 to 8 p.m. at Eastside. And it's an open house kind of invite. It doesn't start at 6. You can come any time between 6 and 8. I do want to add a, one more thing to the recruitment piece. We are working on getting all of our flyers, um, so they're both English and Spanish, trying to reach out to um, our Spanish community, our Hispanic community. So we will have the open house, the flyer of dates the showcase flyer is out in Spanish so we're working on that as well as part of our recruitment is making sure that we are being friendly in those translated documents um, our magnet phone number we have the message in both English and Spanish so that's ready to go and working through that so just as another recruitment piece trying to make sure we're inclusive of the language piece as well thank you Ms. Abbott uh, just two things. One, I was going to say, when you form that committee, it'd probably be a really good idea to, to have a couple of magnet teachers on, the, on that committee. Yes, ma'am. That's already in the works. And then the other thing was, is just my perspective on this new school. And this is just how I look at it. But as I heard about it and I started thinking about it, I thought we have already have a facility that's already been remodeled. It's over there. And if it's a magnet school, it's going to draw all kinds of kids. And we can pull kids from Metcalf, from Rawlings, from Lake Forest, from Williams. There'll be kids coming from Westside for it. And all those kids are starting on fairly equal footing in kindergarten. I think that it'll be easy to get teachers for, for these programs, high quality teachers in there. And so for me, there's I'm, I'm looking at it as kind of a very innovative way to solve some of the problems that we're having difficulty solving and again money is always an issue but when you're pulling kids from all those schools you've got teaching units that are disappearing and going to this new school um, and, and, it, and it could get to the point and I'm not I'm not reading your mind or trying to put words in your mouth but it could get to the point to where you have schools that possibly need to be combined because the numbers are lower and I, and I don't even know if that's where you were thinking about getting an administrator from, but you know, I think there are many possibilities to it. Is it quick? Yeah. Do I like it? I, I want some movement, and this is some movement, and and so, you know, let's 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 see what we can do with it. Thank you. So all hearts and minds are clear. <laughs> What's bulk mail? Is that paper or is that like email and like like mass emails? We're planning oh. to do both. Yeah. Sorry, both, but like we sent out an invitation, snail mail, to every eighth grader in the district, inviting them to the showcase, kind of talking about what it would be like, making sure everybody knew it, it was 
all 18 high school magnets, not just the CTE magnets. Thank you all for a great job. Good, good discussion. Uh, this meeting is adjourned, 346.